Well, good morning, everybody. Great to have you here for our second day. As is uh, quite usual on the second day, we start a little bit uh, later than uh, on the first day. Um, I have an announcement for those who are with us via the YouTube live stream. There's also an, a text and announcement um, in that live stream because it is not working very perfectly. There might be some um, difficulties, but there's also a second option. If you want to join us via the live stream, you can also go to the website of the church that is broadcasted via internet and the information should be on the uh, YouTube live stream, but it is Kerkdienst gemist, that's Dutch, I can't help it. It means that s sometimes you miss a church service, Kerkdienst gemist, and then the Nederlands gereformeerde kerk Kampen, or Nieuwe Kerk Kampen, and if NG, NG Kampen, N Okay. Well, I hope this information is, is helpful. And otherwise, you can try on Google, our best friend in difficult cases, Nieuwe Kerk Kampen, and then via the website and Google Translate, hopefully you will be able to find an alternative live stream. It is also my honor and a pleasure to introduce Tae Hyon Park, he will be our first speaker today, and he will join us via the Zoom connection. He was a student, a PhD student at the Theological University in Apeldoorn, and he translated Herman Baving's Gereformeerde Dogmatiek into Korean at the Free University in Amsterdam from 2005 to 2010. After serving the Korean church in Amstelveen, he is now teaching theology at Chongqing University in Seoul, and we are very honored to have one of the translators of Hermann Baving's Reform Dogmatics in our midst, online, and we are very eager to hear what you want to share with us under the title Bavink on eloquence. If I may give you uh, one tip, also because of our experiences yesterday, try to speak as if you are speaking in a large church building, even if you're sitting in your office, because this is a large building and we need some time for the echo. So if you speak a little bit slowly, that is helpful in most cases. And it is great to see you now also after having welcomed you, and please, we are eager to listen to your presentation. Thank you for uh, introducing me, Hank. So, I would like to begin expressing my gratitude to Theological University Campus and Neo Calvinism Research Institute for hosting such an academic feast, Herman Babing Centennial Congress. And I'm delighted and honored to be invited to this celebration and to have the opportunity to explore Babing's eloquence with you. After completing my Korean translation project of Babing's Reformed Dogmatics at the Hard SA of the Free University of Amsterdam in 2010, I was deeply blessed by Babing's fast knowledge and fairness, as well as his passion and dedication to the Reformed theology. In particular, as a politician, I was drawn to a small booklet called Eloquence, The Bell's Blackened Hate, 
which is only about 70 pages in a small size. Generally speaking, a homiletician is naturally and distinctly curious about the art of speaking for the effective proclamation of the gospel. But this booklet of a good preacher like Bobbing stimulated my curiosity even more that Bobbing was a good preacher had already been proven in his pastoral ministry in Franeker for about one and a half a year. Although he was an unmarried young pastor, he preached like an experienced preacher. Bobbing was an excellent preacher. Land Fair, who heard of Bobbing's preaching in person, says, Bobbing was a predicator by name and hate, Dutch. Not only that, Bobbing, as a professor, published the first edition of his magnum opus, a premiere of the dogmatic, before publishing this booklet. In other words, he had already established a firm theological foundation for his sermons. Of course, Bobbing has been widely recognized in the Dutch Reformed Church's academic circles through his teaching ministry and numerous writings. In this connection, James Eglinton tries to bridge the gap between preaching and the theology in his book, Hartman Bobbing on Preaching and Preachers. The eloquence introduced by Bobbing, who has almost perfect conditions for preaching, in my opinion, not only satisfies my curiosity, but also teaches me in many ways. A few years ago, Professor Sinclair Ferguson notes, quote, the value of eloquence and the importance of rhetoric have largely vanished. Today's seminaries and training institutions and organizations are more focused on hermeneutics and modes of communication than on eloquence in preaching. But in any event, the old styles and emphasis are largely gone, end quote. Therefore, today I would like to commemorate Bobbing's lasting ministry for the church for an analysis and evaluation of his book, Eloquence. Unfortunately, there is no substantial study on Bobbing's eloquence, as far as I know. But this booklet teaches us fundamental things for our days. So my presentation will be divided into three parts. First, the occasion and purpose of eloquence. Second, an analysis of eloquence. Third, an evaluation of eloquence and the suggestion of the modern preachers of the 21st century. First, Bob Inc. gave a lecture on eloquence at Gampa in 1889, whose audience consisted mostly of theological students. So his lecture was clearly directed to future preachers. Nevertheless, Bob Inc. points out that good eloquence is virtue. Everyone needs, not for preachers. In his introduction to eloquence, Bobbing clearly states three reasons why he had a lecture on this subject. First, Bobbing was well aware that eloquence was not only a developed field in the work of Christianity, but also that there was a shortage of good and attentive preachers in the Dutch pulpit at the time. Second, as a more important reason, 
New changes in social life outside the church demanded the necessity of developing the gift of speech intelligently. The new changes in social life are, according to Bobbing, the power of newspapers to influence the minds of the masses and govern their judgment, and the speech in all kinds of meetings, including parliaments, political parties, and conferences. However, Bobby could consider the core of the problem to be the secularization of the church. That is, the loss of solid knowledge of the truth rather than simply a matter of the media. Quote, secularization thus expands in wide circles. Sound knowledge of the truth is starting to become the exception. The Bible and Catechism yield to newspaper and magazine, brochure and novel, end quote. Therefore, Babinko encourages pastors not to waste their gift preaching, but to become a master of the world to win people's conscience. Quote, if they want to remain masters of people's conscience, they have to make sure that they remain masters of the world and the court. In this regard, we remember that Puritan preachers of the 16th and the 17th century advised us to learn the Bible and the human heart, conscience, the two things that preachers must study. Third, Barbink's lecture ultimately calls on pastors to work hard and train for the glory of the gospel and proclaim it as a demonstration of the Holy Spirit and of power. Quote, certainly the gospel of Christ doesn't need our declarations, our persuasive words of human wisdom. It is true and beautiful and rich of itself. But in order to present it in all of its glory, to speak it in a demonstration of the spirit and of power, during practice, persistent effort, loving dedication are demanded. And now that we have looked at the occasion and purpose of the publication, let's take a look at the contents of eloquence. Barbink divides his lecture into three parts, the principle, the essence, and the form of eloquence. The principle of eloquence First, in exploring the principle of eloquence, Barbink points out that the origin of all things lies in God's creative based on the words of John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word. Quote, by speaking, he, God, creates and recreates all things. He speaks and it is so. Ends, and it is done. Behold the absolute, divine, original power of the word. And all might from every other world springs from this and has therein its origin and image. And Babing points out that the creation is not just a text where one must be served. Our world then becomes again what it must be, as the image of a likeness of ourselves, and be ourselves once again the image and likeness of God. Then it is not empty either or hollow, but rather the revelation of the most intimate part of man. When the passion of the part comes to the world, eloquence will be born. In other words, when the soul is touched, affected, and driven, the real source of eloquence is locked within us. But only in the history or the evidence in the training of art. But also, not together, it finds its source 
only in the human heart and court. The essence of eloquence. Barbic is firmly convinced the essence of eloquence is consisted of argument for the mind, relationship between eloquence and philosophy or science. He also needs to prove it come from the whole person and direct it to the whole person through understanding, heart, and will. We can see here, Barbin could relate the essence of eloquence to the elements of the classical rhetoric, logos, pathos, and ethos. Concerning the knowledge for the orator, Barbic suggested to study hard for solid knowledge and real science. Even though the knowledge is necessary for the orator, Barbic warns not to fall into the other extreme, which makes the oratoric speech into an arsenal of learning. For the pulpit is not lectern. For Barbic to have knowledge is not enough for the orator. Pray for his hearers that they be reconciled to God. Eloquence is an argument. It is a drama and an act. Finally, it is more than that, all of those things together. It is a fight and a struggle. The orator must wrestle with his hearers. He must persuade them. The form of eloquence. Barbink believes that though the form of eloquence is doubtless secondary to the matter and content, its presentation is surely of great worth. The presentation needs to be suitable and harmonized to the content of the most impressive paper of generation or to skills. Barbink ultimately encourages gospel preachers to preach in the power and demonstration of the spirit. Second, in relation to the principle of eloquence, Barbink emphasizes the necessity of regeneration of a human being. For Barbink, as the image of God, man can find the true eloquence in the regeneration. For the source of true eloquence is found only in the regenerated human mind. Eloquence is a God's gift, but it doesn't neglect the training of Third, regarding the essence of eloquence, Barbink emphasizes the help of God the Spirit for the conversion of the hearers. The faculty of the person with the knowledge, heart, and will is directly related to the logos, pathos, and ethos. In particular, in persuading the will, Barbink emphasizes the necessity of prayer, which shows a unique before the theological perspective. This is because the will of man cannot be persuaded unless the Holy Spirit bends the will. Concerning the form of eloquence, Barbink emphasizes the harmony between the content and form of eloquence. The form of oratory requires our whole being in its presentation, and yet doesn't overlook the importance of bodily movements in particular. Barbing emphasizes that true value and function of eloquence is found only in Christianity, which provides the reconciliation of God and man, of spirit and matter, of content and form, of soul and body, of thought and language, of the word and gesture. Therefore, Barbing's eloquence is primarily characterized by formed theology, deeply rooted in the scriptures. Thankfully, Barbing will disappoint modern homileticians who seek the effect of preaching only in the methods or techniques. Conclusion, now, Looking back at what we have surveyed, we may ask, what are the implications of Barbing's eloquence for us today? Although Barbing's eloquence is not a treatise on preaching, at least the three points can be helpful for modern preachers. First, preachers must train 
that of God, God has given to us so that the witness of the gospel bears fruit. For God's gifts and art are not mutually exclusive. Not only preachers, but also ordinary Christians should also learn eloquence to testify the gospel word. Second, preachers should focus on studying the scriptures, keeping in mind that they must become pastors of the world in order to become a master of the conscience of their hearers. In our secularized age, church revival, I believe, doesn't consist in many programs or invention, but in the witness of the word of God alone, sola scriptura. Lastly, preachers should become praying persons, seeking the help of the Spirit, recognizing that in order to persuade their hearers, they need the demonstration and power of the Spirit, not the wisdom of human words. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, um, Tae Hee Yoon, for your nice presentation. And I would also say eloquent presentation, though we don't have you here, on Baving's thoughts on eloquence. I teach a course at the Free University on academic presenting. And every year, I let the students read this text from Baving, because that's the food tradition as well. But um, they mostly like it. And say that all preachers should read the text of Baving. Are there any questions? We have a few minutes for one or two questions from the audience. Yeah? Um, James, James Eglinton. It's, it's not working. Okay, can you, you can hear me now? Yes. Right. No. Thank you. Yes, uh, sorry. So thank you for your paper, for bringing the eloquence text to our attention in the conference. Um, one of the things that I find very interesting about the eloquence text uh, in its original context is that it also contains a critique of late modernity the, the sleepy Dutchman who's indifferent to suffering or to, or to, to beauty and who finds it very easy to be um, very distant and calm and collected. So the, in the Dutch text, the Jan Sally character um, who, who is dulled to these extremes around him, which is, a, I think, a criticism of late modern people in the West in general. I think it's what Charles Taylor goes on to talk about as a, as a buffered self in, in very similar terms in Bavink. So I think it's a very fruitful text still in Western culture in helping people, and I use the text as well to help people think through preaching in a Western context. Uh, we have a very distant sense of self in the West and it's very easy to still be a, a Jan Sally kind of figure, uh, not to be deeply affected in, in your inner life, in your chemut by God or the creation. Um, in using the text in, in a Korean context, um, does that kind of critique carry over? Do you have to uh, explain it differently? Or uh, how, how easily does the text transfer into your context on that specific point? OK, thank you for your uh, good question. Uh, I think um, Babink uh, uh, gives us uh, the fundamental things which is uh, uh, rooted in uh, the scripture, especially when he starts his uh, lecture, he quotes the uh, biblical uh, passage uh, denying that uh, the uh, greatest uh, Faust, uh, 
the German poet Goethe, who was the pantheist. So the uh, I was actually surprised to see that the Bab Inc starts with the origin of all things, and that is the uh, starting point for him to eloquence. So the I believe he uh, Bab Inc. Uh, says sometimes, well, the, the other extreme of the fault that the, to say, uh, to use your hands or gestures, something like that, it is not so much uh, the extra things uh, that, that is too extreme. It is like uh, the caricature. So don't you need to control your gestures and something like that. So the in Korean culture, I believe, so the uh, to bring uh, Babi's idea uh, into our context, and then that is uh, to use um, mild gesture. Or the I think the the important thing, the most important thing, is to uh, start uh, with. Uh, biblical uh, the foundation. That is the important thing, I believe. Thank you. Is there one other final question? If not, let's again say... I, I, have, oh. I have one final question. That's it's a, a, it's okay. a funny one. Go ahead. Uh, Ta it's very good to see you. As, as you may know, Taeyun translated Bavink's dogmatics into Korean, so I'd like to praise him for that on, on, that oca on, on this occasion. But my question is about um, the stress and the relevance of eloquence. What do you think of Moses? You mean, the, uh, what about Moses uh, the, in the, regarding the eloquence? Yes, because Moses was, the, the least we can say, Moses was not eloquent. Anyway, that's what he says of himself. Yeah. He, and he, so, was, he, he was selected by God, elected by yes. God to be the leader. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good question and difficult question. Uh, but uh, the, I believe uh, the God was with him. That is the point. So the, uh, and Babing says, not of uh, the variety of words or human wisdom, but God's word has got power. So uh, in this, I believe, uh, in that point, Moses has got power to deliver his message from God. Thank you. And, and, and maybe, I don't know about Moses, but if you are too self-confident about your own eloquence, that mostly wastes the whole eloquence itself. So, thank you again, and uh, we want to thank you for joining us and sharing your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker that I want to introduce and welcome is Chang Jung Choi. He is with us from South Korea, together with his dear wife. You even travel to the Netherlands to be with us and also maybe a little bit to celebrate the fact of your um, finishing your dissertation on Herman Bavink and John Calvin. You defended that at the University of Apeldoorn some time ago and it was a privilege for me and for James and for Bruce Pass to be on the committee. Uh, of course, that is secret. We're not allowed to share things from the committee in public, but I want to make one exception because beforehand, Arnold Huygen, who was your promoter, made a joke with um, James and Bruce Pass and myself that we were in a kind of struggle who would have the most Bavink-like beard of the three of us. But I think Arnold was just jealous that he doesn't have one himself. Anyway, it's good to have you uh, with us and to hear something of your uh, research. At least that is the, the expectation. So please feel very welcome to share your thoughts with us this morning. Uh, 
It's my honor to com commemorate Bob Incon this centennial conference. I'm delighted to be here today to make you a presentation about Bob Inc. and Kelvin on the image of God. In my presentation, I'd like to emphasize how Bob Inc.'s doctrine of the image of God differs from that of Kelvin. There has been a general awareness of Bob Inc. as a faithful follower of Kelvin. In, re in Reformed and Bob Inc. scholarships, theologians have been used to regarding Bob Inc. and Kelvin to be in the same line of the Reformed tradition. Thus, little has been known about the difference between them. In this slide, I'm going to focus on the difference between Bob Inc. and Kelvin, especially on the image of God. Both Bob Inc. and Kelvin conceive the divine origin of humanity following the teaching of Scripture, that human beings were created in God's image. However, there are obvious differences between them on the image of God in terms of the essence, nature, and destiny of human beings. So today, I'm going to explain how Bob Inc.'s doctrine of the image of God differs from that of Kelvin, and how he developed the doctrine of the image of God with his Trinitarian voice and insights. Especially, Bob Inc. applies the doctrine of the Trinity in his doctrine of the image of God. In his view, the doctrine of the Trinity forms a core element in his understanding of humanity as the image of God. For Bob Inc., human beings were created after the image of the triune God. Bob Inc. emphasizes that the doctrine of the Trinity presents the rationale for an abundant understanding of humanity created after not merely the image of God, but the image of the triune God. So in this presentation, I would say, Babing's doctrine of the image of God is more Trinitarian than that of Kelvin. It seems to me that Babing's emphasis on the immanent Trinity and the relationship between the immanent and economic Trinity reflects the distinctiveness of Bobbing's thought. By the end of this presentation, I hope you understand Bobbing's elaboration on humanity as the image of the triune God trace the origin of humanity more deeply than that of Kelvin, seek the nature of humanity more richly and widely than that of Kelvin, and describes human destiny in far greater detail than that of Kelvin. My presentation is divided into four parts. First, I'm going to start by looking at the definition of the essence of humanity between Bob Inc. and Kelvin. Second, I'm going to move on the origin of humanity between them. Third, I will talk about the nature of humanity between them. Finally, I'm going to discuss the destiny of humanity between Bob Inc. and Kelvin. First, concerning the essence of humanity, Bob Inc. devotes considerable attention to the precise definition of the essence humanity, particularly relation to the image of God. For Bob Inc., the image of God is intimately bound up with the essence of humanity. In Bobbing's understanding, the essence of humanity is incorporated into the image of God. He explicitly start, states that a human being is the image of God. This definition, the Bobbing states, is in essence different from that of Kelvin. Kelvin declares that a human being bears the image of God. It is remarkable then that Bobbing opts for the term is 
rather than bears or have. By doing so, Babink directs his attention to considering the image of God as constituted for the essence of humanity in an ontological sense. Babing's argumentation is based on the archetypal and actipal distinction between God and creation of reform theology and his deployment of analogical metaphor. Namely for Babing, God is the absolute archetype for human beings. Human beings manifest God's attributes and perfections as the archetype of God analogically. In this way, Babink declares that the essence of humanity is its being created in the image of God. While the image of God is inseparable from its essence in human nature in Babink's theology, for Calvin, the image of, image of God does not refer human essence itself in an ontological dimension. Rather, Calvin emphasizes the relational aspect of the image of God. Calvin defines humanity as bearing the image of God. Calvin clearly denies the identification of the image of God and the essence of humanity. Unlike Babing's ontological emphasis on the image of God as consisted, constitutive for the essence of humanity, Kelvin relatively underlines the significance of the relationship between God and humanity. Of course, Kelvin also underlines the significance of the relationship between God and uh, no, no. The underlines the significance of the ontological dignity of a human being in distinction from other creatures. However, Kelvin warns against mystical tendencies of his days concerning the at attempts to blur the line between God and creation. He is very cautious about any notions that the essence of humanity is an emanation of God's very essence. For Kelvin, it is enough to stress that human being bears the image of God in distinction from all other creatures. More importantly, in Kelvin's view, the relational aspect between God and humanity is the distinguishing characteristic of humanity. In Kelvin's mind, the state of being of humanity as the image of God is sustained only in communion with God. Apart from the fellowship of God, human nature by itself cannot bear the integrity of human nature. In light of this, Kelvin describes the father-children relationship between God and humanity as an integral part of the image of God. And for Kelvin, the image of God is best expressed with the term mirror as the reflection of God the Father's glory. We looked at the difference between Babink and Kelvin concerning the definition of the image of God. Babink declares a human being is the image of God, emphasizing the ontological aspect. But Kelvin states that a human being bears the image of God, emphasizing the relational aspect. The second point that I want to talk about is origin of humanity. As I said earlier, both Babink and Kelvin are convinced that God created human beings as the image of God, firmly based on the teaching of scripture. So, concerning the divine origin of humanity as the image of God, there is no place for doubt concerning God's creation of humanity in both theologians. However, there is certainly a difference between Babing's argumentation of human origin that, uh, and that of Kelvin. I would say Babing traces the origin of human being more deeply than that of Kelvin. 
Calvin starts his argument from the doctrine of God. But Babin starts from the doctrine of the triune God. For Calvin, God is the starting point for defining the origin of humanity, but the confession of the triune God is the starting point as well as the main point for Babin. In his days, Calvin did not have to wade into the debate on the divine origin of humanity. Thus, the question of God's creation of humanity was not the main point at issue at all for Calvin. In contrast, in Babin's context, he dedicated himself to defending the doctrine of creation and promoting the divine origin of humanity over against the views of human origin which arose from the pantheism, materialism, and evolutionism. Babing needed a new articulation of divine origin of human being, and he attempted to provide a theological foundation by the doctrine of the Trinity. Babing calls attention to the immanent Trinity, which means especially an infinite fullness of life as divine fecundity and an absolute divine communication among the three persons of the Godhead. Babing's conviction is that the divine fullness of life and divine communication within the immanent trinity make creation possible. It means that for Babing, the immanent trinity is the precondition for the economic trinity. Babing argues that generation of the Son from Father and procession of the Spirit from the Father and the Spirit in the divine being make possible all God's economic works, such as creation and revelation. So the immanent trinity provides the ontological ground for all creation as well as human origin. Babing criticized the alternative understanding of creation as fundamentally unbiblical on the grounds that the doctrine of the immanent trinity and the relationship between the immanent and economic trinity gives a satisfactory answer to the rational for Babing's affirmation of the divine origin of a human being. In this regard, given that Babing's main argumentation for God's creation of humanity lies in the inner life and relationship of the three persons within the immanent trinity. In my view, Babing articulates human origin more deeply from the immanent relationships of the three persons of the triune God than that than Kevin does from God. The next point I want to talk about is the nature of humanity. I would say, Babing maintains the nature of humanity more richly than Calvin. Babing declares the whole human person is ontologically constituted the image of God. In Babing's words, the whole being, not something in man, but man himself, is the image of God. Babing affirms the whole person, including all capacities, abilities, and properties of human nature, and even the body, is the, human, is the image of God. That is, nothing in human beings is excluded from the image of God. On this basis, while Calvin argues that a human being bears the image of God only in the soul. Babing argues that the image of God embraces the whole human being, the soul, faculties, virtues, and even the body are part of God's image. So the whole person belongs to the image of God, and the image of God is firmly placed on the whole human being. For Kelvin, since God is not physical, the human body is so far from being 
able to bear the image of God. All human faculties, including the body, manifest God's attributes for his glory. But for Kelvin, the image of God should never be extended to the body because God is not corporeal. Kelvin shines the spotlight on the soul alone as the proper seat of the image of God. For Kelvin, the soul only can be called the image of God. In Kelvin's view, the attempt to relate the image of God to body is nothing more than a commingling heaven and earth. So the body should be ruled out from the image of God. In the light of this, Kelvin criticizes Andres, Andreas Oceander for discriminately extending the image of God to the human body. It is evident Kelvin focused exclusively on the image of God in the soul within humanity. By contrast, for Babing, the triune God makes the human being as a whole possible to be the image of God. Babing argues that the triune God is the archetype for human beings, and human beings manifest the archetype of the triune God as the act type. And at this point, the concept of analogy also makes possible Babing's argumentation of the whole human person as the image of God. Hence, the whole human person manifests divine attributes and virtues as an analogical image of God. In Babing's view, um, Calvin, uh, Calvin is not interested in using the analogical language for explaining human nature as the image of God, but uh, one can find the specified commitment to Babing's relentless use of analogical metaphor more with respect to the whole human person. In this regard, more than Kelvin, Babing relates the whole human person with the image of God, declaring that human body belongs integrally to the image of God with human faculties and human virtues. Furthermore, concerning the nature of humanity, Babing also extends the image of God to every human being more widely than that of Kelvin. According to Babing, when the image of God is considered in humanity as a whole, its meaning can be fully unfolded. On the basis of the archetypal and actypal distinction between the triune God and humanity, Babing focuses on the unity and diversity in the triune God. In his view, absolute unity, absolute diversity in the immanent trinity. From this point of view, Babing also emphasizes the organic character of humanity. Not only the individual, but also the human race were organically created in the image of God. In its organic unity and diversity of human humanity as a whole, the fullness of the image of the triune God can be found. For Babing, every human person is an organic member of the whole human race, and not the man alone, nor the man and woman together, but only the whole of humanity is the fully developed image of God. In the light of this, human beings are described as a living soul, an organic unity, one race, and one family. Hence, for Babing, humanity stands force and will be raised up together with the emphasis on humanity as a whole and his distinct emphasis on humanity as an organism, Babing extends the image of God to the whole human race more widely than Kelvin. Finally, Babing describes human destiny in far greater detail and more fully than Kelvin. Concerning human destiny, both Babing 
and Kelvin maintain that the human destiny is to glorify God by manifesting God's attributes and virtues as a mirror. God's glory is indeed central to the destiny of humanity as the image of God in both theologians. Then what is Barbing's distinctive emphasis on human destiny in comparison with that of Kelvin? Barbing advanced a step further than Kelvin in making a connection between the divine attributes and the exercise of the threefold offices of prophet, priest, and king. Concerning human nature, the image of God endowed with knowledge, righteousness, and holiness is constitutive of human nature. In his view, human beings were created after God's image in true knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. For Babink, these virtues of knowledge, righteousness, and holiness were given to humanity as the image of God in the state of integrity at creation. At this point, Babink relates these threefold offices of Christ directly to the virtues of knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. Namely, human being was created as the prophet who proclaims the true knowledge, as the priest who manifests holiness, as the king who displays right righteousness for the God's glory. glory. In this regard, Babink emphasizes that the unfolding of the image of God is intimately related to the exercising the threefold offices of prophet, priest, and king. Not only the individual, but also humanity as a whole were created after his image in order to serve him as prophet, priest, and king by manifesting the true knowledge, holiness, and righteousness. Concerning the threefold office of Christ, both Babink and Kelvin share the notion of Christ as the mediator. But Babink further connects the threefold office with human destiny. That is, the exercise of the threefold office provides the foundation for the understanding of human destiny, namely, humankind can manifest God's attributes and virtues such as knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. Babing treats these divine attributes as communicable attributes of God. And by exercising the threefold office, human can be participating in the communicable attributes in the immanent trinity. Within the framework of Babing's Trinitarian thoughts, the immanent trinity is mirrored in the economic trinity. The divine attributes such as knowledge, righteousness, and holiness within the immanent trinity are mirrored in divine works of the economic trinity. According to Babing, human origin is based on the immanent trinity. Human beings restored through the economic trinity, and human destiny is to manifest God's attributes of knowledge, righteousness, and holiness in the immanent trinity. By exercising the threefold office, prophet, priest, and king for his glory. Therefore, from the immanent trinity and through the economic trinity and to the immanent trinity are human beings truly human as the image of God in Babing's thoughts. Well, I'd like to end by emphasizing the main points. Babing's doctrine of the image of God is basically different from that of Kelvin. Babing declares a human being is the image of God, but for Kelvin, a human being bears the image of God. And Babing's doctrine of the image of God is more Trinitarian 
than that of Kelvin, following the four reasons. First, Babink trace the, the origin of humanity more deeply than Kelvin, starting from God's immanent Trinitarian relationships. Second, Babink articulates the nature of humanity more richly than Kelvin, defining the whole human person as the image of God. Third, Babing extends the image of God to human beings as a whole more widely than Kelvin. Finally, Babing describes human destiny in far greater detail than Kelvin. Thank you for listening. God bless you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, but is there also not a problem in Bavink? If you, uh, you, you speak about the analog analogy of uh, God and uh, human being, mm -hmm. um, I heard that it uh, was uh, related to the unity and diversity in God. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, do you not bring God and human being uh, uh, too much uh, together? Eh? That, 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 that the difference and the distance between creator and uh, creation and creature uh, disappears. Um, and is there also not a problem with, uh, uh, with our body? Because God has not a body. And, and mm. Kelvin uh, addresses that. Uh, well, yeah, two questions uh, yeah. uh, uh, in, rela okay. in relation yeah. to your Thank uh, you for your paper. question. Yeah, for Kelvin, uh, that's the problem to extend image of God to human body. So he uh, denies the kinds of attempts against Oceander or Cerebetus. Yes, that's correct. But Babink bravely relate image of God is the essence of humanity and even the body can manifest God's glory, God's uh, uh, virtues based on the reformed distinction, archetypal and actypal theology, and analogically, analogically, human being kind of uh, organ organic uh, relationship manifests God's glory more fully. Uh, so he really uh, used uh, analogical metaphor than Kelvin. Kelvin denies analogical metaphor. Yeah. So, um, ontologically, Babing also says uh, there is an infinite gulf between God and creation. When we go to heaven, we cannot be united with God, absolutely. But he can say, analogically, grandfather, father, and grandson, if they gather together, they can manifest God's glory more and more. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah, that's the difference, uh, theological emphasis on analo analogy between Kelvin and Babing, I think so, yeah. Good, I suggest that we have the further discussion during the coffee break. We started 10 minutes later, we lost five minutes, so we will have a shorter coffee break. There's only coffee and tea anyway, so try to be back at 15 past, 20 past, the latest for our next session with Bruce Pass, and it's almost bedtime for him anyway in Australia. Thank you again, and join me in thanking the presentation.
chơi cái tác phẩm này Good morning, we have you uh, online. You can hear me, coffee yourself or something else, but we have connection, that's important. Thank you. Um, and
Hey, Bruce. <laughs> Just saying hi before we begin. Good to see you. <laughs> oh, I guess I can't hear you. Uh, you can hear me. Anyway, uh, we'll hear from you soon. But. Hi, Bruce. Can you hear me and see me? We are a little bit later, but um, in a minute I will introduce you when the audience is back from, from the coffee. Well, it is my honor and privilege to introduce Bruce Pass to you. Bruce is a lecturer in Christian thought and history 
and the director of the postgraduate program at the Brisbane School of Theology. And he has also initiated a Australian conference on Bavink that will be held in December. And it's a pity, of course, for us that we cannot be there and for you, Bruce, that you cannot be here. But through the internet connection, at least we are very close to each other. Um, Bruce is also the editor and translator of the orations, the academic orations of Hermann Bavink titled On Theology. And he had the courage to suggest to Brill to use the caricature of Bavink. Probably you know the caricature with the enormous head and the very small body on the cover page of On Theology. Bruce, we are very eager to learn from you about Bavink and Dutch colonial policy and divine providence under the head title, main title, of Java script with a question mark. I first thought that it was a mistake from the, from the printer, but we are curious what you want to share with us on that subject. Thank you, Hank. It's indeed a pleasure to uh, be with you. Um, I might just quickly ask if uh, there's any echo happening for you over there. Yeah, there is some echo. So take, take uh, a little bit more distance from your computer and uh, speak slowly. Okay. Well, this paper is uh, the beginning or the first half of a longer paper in which I seek to make constructive use of Bavink's Doctrine of Providence and bring Bavink into conversation with uh, contemporary theologians and philosophers. But the, uh, the first section which I shall share uh, this evening uh, from Australia is the historical part which is most appropriate for the centenary celebrations. While many reformed theologians have reflected at length on the subject of politics, few reformed theologians have pursued active clinical careers. This is what makes Hermann Bavink a particularly fascinating figure as Bavink not only produced a substantial body of work in several theological subdisciplines, but also served as a sitting member of the Dutch Parliament. Although Bavink's uh, parliamentary speeches provide a fascinating lens through which his doctrinal formulations may be viewed, these speeches remain largely neglected. In this paper, I would like to consider the way that Bavink's account of divine providence is illumined by the parliamentary speeches, which touch on the subject of colonial policy in the Dutch East Indies. In what follows, I will briefly trace the main contours of Bavink's account of divine providence outlining some of its unique features before highlighting ways that certain comments on the relationship in which colonial policy stands to foreign missions exposes difficulties in Bavink's formulation of this doctrine. By way of conclusion, I shall offer some preliminary remarks on how Bavink's doctrine of providence might be appropriated by contemporary projects of theoretical retreat. And that's the bit that I won't uh, share with you tonight because that would make it much too long. The first, Bavink on the providence of God. Bavink's most expansive discussion of the providence of God is to be found in the second volume of Reformed Dogmatics. Bavink maintains what might be described as a meticulous account of divine providence and articulates his version of this doctrine according to the categories of preservation, 
concurrence and government. Barbing thus reduplicates the basic contours of the reformed orthodox account of this doctrine. But there are also a number of features which mark out Barving's account as a distinctly modern variant on an ancient theme. One might even argue that some form of variation was necessary as many of the assumptions that underpin the classical formulation of this doctrine could no longer be taken for granted. In the 17th century, there was basic consensus on the metaphysical conditions of the God-world relation. Molinist and Socinian objections notwithstanding, Roman Catholic and Protestant theologians still approached the question of divine providence from the standpoint of classical theism. The situation at the end of the 19th century, however, was very different. The Kantian critique of knowledge had dissolved the assumption of correspondence between efficient and final causes. Thus, any reiteration of the classical affirmation of God's preservation and government of the world would need to offer a robust defense of the claim that material means serve divine ends. Bavink was well aware of this problem and drew on the organicism of the first generation of post kantian idealists in order to address the philosophical difficulties that a meticulous account of divine providence precipitates. Providence, according to Bavink, is a description of the relation in which God stands to his creatures. And it is a relation which can be described as organic. Yet in order to understand precisely what Barvink is affirming in his use of the term organic, it is necessary to step out in some detail what the organism presupposes. In his early Natur philosophy, Schelling defines the organism as an entity that is both self-generating and self-organizing. In so doing, Schelling draws upon the account of natural purpose outlined in Kant's critique of the power of judgment. The decisive difference in Schelling, however, is that natural purpose functions as a constitutive rather than a regulative principle. That is, whereas in Kant, natural purpose functions as a transcendental postulate, Schelling affirms natural purpose, understood as Lebenskraft, or dynamic power, as an inherent feature of reality. The organism, therefore, reconnects efficient and final causes, bridging the Kantian gulf between the real and the ideal. Although Barbic rejected the indirect identity of subject and object, which is an entailment of Schelling's solution to Kant's problem, he recognized the usefulness of the organism for reaffirming traditional convictions about the God world relation in a post enlightenment context. By describing the God-world relation as organic, Mavic could affirm the correspondence of efficient and final causes. Moreover, the organism is easily mapped onto specifically reformed convictions. For Mavic, the idea or purpose that governs the world and its history is the divine decree. And the living force, or Lebenskraft, that animates the organism of the cosmos can readily be identified with the third person of the Holy Trinity. Yet most important, the organism affords an affirmation of an indirect 
rather than direct correspondence of efficient and final causes. That is, an efficient cause is coordinate rather than subordinate to the end to which the entity is ordered. This is the difference between absolute idealism and pre-modern Aristotelian notions of correspondence. Whereas for Aristotle, the efficient cause simply is the means by which a final cause is realized, this is not the case in an organism. Mechanism and teleology represent two distinct yet irreducible modes of description of the self-same entity. The indirectness of this correspondence is of a special importance to Bavink for a number of reasons. First, Bavink was especially wary of any reduction of reality to mere mechanism. And there are a number of intellectual currents at the end of the 19th century which threaten just this. Positivism, materialist monism, and Darwinian naturalism all threaten the expulsion of both imminent and transcendent teleology from their respective descriptions of the world. Hence, Bavink frequently asserted that, and I quote, mechanical connection is only one mode in which a number of things in the world relate to each other, end quote. And that in addition to the mechanical relation, there is also a teleological relation. Yet in affirming the specifically indirect nature of the correspondence of mechanism and teleology, I think could shield his account of divine providence from the findings of modern science. Second, the indirect correspondence of efficient and final causes contributes to Bavink's defense of concurrence. The distinction between primary and secondary causes proved increasingly tendentious in the modern era, yet it is an essential component of a meticulous account of divine providence. The indirect identities of efficient and final causes that the organism presupposes upholds the reality of creaturely agency, while offering a further line of defence against the charge that a meticulous divine providence makes God the author of evil. That is, by aligning teleology with primary causes and mechanism with secondary causes, Bavink is able to distance the actions of creaturely agents from the divine ends that they accomplish. Third, the indirect correspondence of mechanism and teleology has specific relevance for difficulties encountered in a specifically reformed account of special providence. Bavink faults reformed orthodoxy for portraying the relation between the divine decree and its realization in purely mechanical terms. That is, he objects to affirming reprobation as a means by which God is glorified. For Bavink, reprobation stands in a coordinate rather than subordinate relation to the end of the decree. In order to explain this, Bavink has recourse to the indirect correspondence of mechanism and teleology that the organism presupposes. This decoupling of mechanism and teleology allows Bavink to affirm that reprobation does result in God's glory, yet it is not directly purposed unto this end. The organic character of the God-world relation is one of the main features of Bavink's providentialism that distinguishes it from that of his reformed orthodoxy. Yet in many other ways, Bavink follows his forebears. For example, in agreement with Calvin and the reformed tradition, Bavink affirms that this relation can be discerned in the order of nature and course of history. While Berkow goes too far in attempting to claim Bavink for Bart's side with his famous dispute with Emil Brunner, 
Berka is correct to point out that in characterizing providence as a mixed article, Barthing does not affirm the possibility of natural theology. What Barthing means when he describes providence in this way is that the Christian derives knowledge of the divine preservation and government of the world, both special and general revelation. Thus, when Christians view nature and history through the lens of special revelation, they can, to some degree, discern the providential hand of God. Interestingly, Barthing thinks that our ability to discern divine providence, even in our personal histories, is indispensable to the doctrine. At the end of the account of divine providence, Barthing poses a rhetorical question. And I quote, what an impoverished faith it would be if it saw God's hand and counsel from afar in a few momentous events, but did not discern it in a person's own life and lot. Implicitly, restricting our ability to discern the hand of God to the course of salvation history would deprive us of the full riches of divine grace. Yet Bavink refrains from spelling out precisely how this might work. Are there patterns of divine providence recorded in the history of Israel that are repeated in the histories of the nations? Are there guide ropes available in the witness of scripture which allows believers to discern the superintendence of God over their own personal histories? Barthink is curiously silent on such matters. Or at least this is the impression one gains from his theological writings. The parliamentary speeches tell a slightly different story. Over the final decade of his life, Barthink was a sitting member of the Fourth Chamber. While this required him to attend its meetings once a week, he did not shoulder responsibilities for the leadership of his party or a cabinet portfolio. This minimal commitment allowed Barthing to discharge his teaching duties at the Free University while actively participating in the political arena. The proceedings record speeches Barthing delivered on a variety of subjects, including women's suffrage, educational policy, poor relief, the League of Nations, it is unfortunate that the content of these speeches has been largely overlooked in the recent literature, as they supplement and qualify Barthing's theological writings in important ways. In particular, the speech Barthing delivered on the 7th of January 1914 on the subject of Dutch colonial policy illumines Barthing's characterization of providence as a mixed article. The burden of this speech is Barthing's conviction that the Christianized peoples of Europe share responsibility for the intellectual, moral, spiritual, and economic elevation of the lower standing peoples. Of the basis of this responsibility, Barthing argues that the tasks of mission and civilization should go hand in hand and that Western governments must support foreign missions. Barving's moral reasoning warrants close attention. In the course of the speech, Barving asks his audience whence this right to impose modern culture on the Javanese derives. In reply to his own question, Barving states that this right derives from the mental superiority, based on the superiority of the Christianized nations, a superiority which Barthing claims exerts an attractive power over the indigenous peoples. Disavowing the use of coercive force, Barthing describes the power of mental superiority as a force that commands respect and brings out a feeling of inferiority and thereby kindles a desire for modern culture. Hence, in civilizing the native populations, 
colonial authorities are not imposing something that is unwanted, but satisfying a natural desire. For contemporary readers of Barvink, these are troubling statements. Yet we must understand Barvink on his own terms. And in order to do so, it is necessary to seek out the doctrinal and ideological pillars on which they rest. Elsewhere, Barvik argues that modern culture represents the fulfillment of a God-given mandate to perfect the latent possibilities of the created order. Modern culture, therefore, is of universal significance. Modern science and history might very well number among the fruits which Christianity has borne for civilization and culture, but these are not the exclusive possessions of the West. The Christian nations are but the guardians of culture, and as guardians they share in a responsibility to bring these treasures, along with the Christian gospel, to undeveloped peoples. Importantly, Barvink views the civilization and Christianization of the Dutch colonies as something of a repeat performance of the civilization and Christianization of Europe. In the same way that the peoples of Northern Europe were childlike in their uncivilized pre-Christian past, yet gained both the gospel and culture from Christian missionaries, the native peoples of the East Indies were receiving both gifts at the hands of Dutch missionaries. James Eglinton's judgment that Barvik seeks to disentangle missions from colonial expansion before is problematic. If anything, Barvik seeks to entwine the neo-colonial agenda and foreign missions even more tightly by insisting not only that the former paved the way for the latter, but also that colonization ought to continue to assist the efforts of Christian mission. In his parliamentary speech, Barvink praises the Berlin Act of 1885, which guaranteed the colonial powers support for missionary enterprise. He lords the glorious ideal, Herrlich Ideal, of the so-called ethical policy, which aimed at elevating the lower standing peoples which had been entrusted to the Dutch. The same sentiment is expressed in a speech delivered at the FU a few years earlier. In that speech, Barvik likened colonial expansion to the division of the Red Sea, which paved the way for the people of Israel to cross over to the promised land. And he describes neo-colonial expansion as a divine summons to preach the gospel to all nations. In an earlier discussion of the same topic, Barvink affirms ongoing colonization in support of missionary efforts. Barvink recommends, and I quote, that colonists should go with the missionaries and bring civilization with their Christianity. Then the example of the colonists even more than the preaching of the missionaries, will arouse in the natives the desire to become Christians. And it will not be long before they convert to Christianity in droves." Unquote. All of these comments illumine Barvik's assertion that it is possible to perceive divine providence not only in special revelation, but also in general revelation that it is possible to discern the hand of God, not only in the course of salvation history, but also in the events of world history. It is this assumption that undergirds Barvink's assessment of modern culture and his characterization of Christian nations as its guardians. It is this assumption that allows Barvink to apply the pattern of the Christianization of Europe to the hoped for Christianization of the East Indies. And it is this assumption that undergirds Barvik's affirmation that the tasks of mission and civilization go hand in hand. 
None of these conclusions regarding the providence of God could be drawn from the witness of scripture alone. Hence the paternalistic and prejudicial statements from which we would now recoil can be traced to Bavink's characterization of providence as a mixed article. Had Bavink characterized providence as a pure article, the door to many of these misjudgments would remain firmly closed. And it's at this point that I start to talk about contemporary uh, accounts of the doctrine of providence, and I shall stop there and uh, hand it back to uh, Nick from the belt. Thank you so much, uh, Bruce. You, you surprised me by stopping a little bit earlier because we were all have, the, have your text and uh, it was very clear. Are there questions? I think there might be many questions and we have some time for discussion. So please raise your hand if you want to ask Bruce something. Okay, so. James? You were mentioned in the paper, so yeah, indeed, sure right so I, to I suppose I have uh, some kind of moral obligation to respond. So thanks, Bruce. A really typically lucid and uh, carefully researched paper. I want to give uh, one bit of pushback against the way that you present my judgment of Bavink as disentangling. Can you understand him, uh, Bruce? Can you hear me, Bruce? Yes, very clearly. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So Bavink is disentangling colonialism from global evangelism. Um, I do have a judgment on that in the book, but my judgment on it is that he disentangles them not to demonstrate the validity of uh, evangelism into the non-Western world as something that's different from and independent of the colonial spread. I think that he disentangles them conceptually in order to make precisely the case that you're arguing, that they depend on each other. Um, and in fact, my paper later on today is, makes it not to do with providence, but basically the same arguments as you've just made. Um, so he disentangles them to make a critique of a kind of hollowed out secular colonial expansion and disentangles them to show or to make a case, a kind of providence doom case for the global religiously fueled uh, warfare that will come if the West only tries to uh, spread colonially without also sharing Christianity. So that's one aspect of the disentangling, it's to make that particular point. But I think the flip side of that point, and it's very helpful that, that you've made a very compelling case for providence from that. The flip side is, is exactly as you say, that for Herman uh, to spread Christianity from the West, you need to spread Western culture. And I don't think that he has a, a very well thought through paradigm for how you might move beyond that. Um, but my paper today is on that, but also then looking at Johann Hermann Bavink as someone who's aware of a lot of these tensions and who tries to think beyond his uncle on this point. So I think I, I do think that we are much more in, in agreement than that passing critique suggests. But I really enjoyed your paper, so thanks. Can you give a short response, uh, Bruce? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I, I think my, my criticism is that disentangling and separation, which are the words that uh, you use in the biography, um, are not the right words. Um, so I think we are in agreement in what Bavink would like to see happen. Uh, but that's, uh, I, I think I would still want to disagree that that is adequately described by those words. I think there's another figure, um, a very controversial figure at the time, Kraut. Um, a missionary uh, comes from the ethical theologian side of things. I think he is advocating a disentangling of the colonial agenda, um, but he creates a lot more controversy because of that. So I'd be very interested to uh, maybe learn more from you on uh, Jan, uh, Johan Bavik and Kraut, uh, but we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Okay, it's a little bit difficult to understand exactly, but uh, if you speak slowly, then, uh, then, then it is okay. George, do you have a question? I, I have a question, Bruce. Uh, thank you for your lecture. 
but um, on, on this issue of disentangling, I think um, the debate was not could you separate mission from the colonial agenda, but the debate in the parliament was uh, what is the colonial agenda? And on the one side you had the liberals who stressed that the colonial agenda was bringing liberalism to the Dutch East Indies, and it's the Christian parties that said, well, our colonial agenda uh, <coughs> means bring, bringing Christianity over there. So there was not a debate about should it be disentangled or not, but what is the basis of our colonial agenda? Is it either the liberal worldview or the Christian worldview? Yeah, there's absolutely a question connected to that, maybe from Kees van der Kooi. And I also saw Jong Hoon. Uh, <clears throat> your, Bruce, uh, your lecture, your last words are intriguing. This seems me a high price to pay. Uh, you refer to the wonderful book of uh, David Ferguson, and uh, uh, it gives a totally different uh, approach to uh, the doctrine of, uh, profit, of uh, providence. What is, can you uh, elaborate a little bit on what the high price to pay is then if we want to retrieve Barbing? Um, yes, I didn't read that bit. I think uh, uh, David Ferguson, to put things uh, simply, would affirm that the deists were at least in part correct. And uh, David uh, rejects a meticulous account of providence. And uh, I think that is the high price to pay. There are a lot of consequences for rejecting a meticulous to pay is in those losses. Okay. Yeah, that's an uh, in interesting discussion. We don't have too much time to go into that uh, deeper. I, I just have one uh, question, uh, one room for one more question. Jong Hoon, you raised your hand already. My name is Zhang Hun Li. I'm from South Korea. I'm, uh, I'm a uh, PhD candidate of Fry University at Amsterdam. Uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a matter of uh, terminology. Uh, mm. In my opinion, uh, concurrence uh, doesn't convey fully the meaning of concursus uh, because the, the dictionary meaning of concurrence uh, is that uh, two or more events occur at the same time. Uh, but in my opinion, uh, the meaning of the concept of concursus, we can find the first and second uh, causes uh, yeah, don't occur simultaneously. But uh, uh, the first cause that is the, the will of, of God and the action of God is always uh, precedes the uh, yeah precedes the human's action and human's will. So I think uh, there is a logical and temporal uh, prece precedence. So so I th so I think that uh, the the, tra the tradition of the tra the tradition of reform the orthodoxy. Uh, for instance, uh, Melchior Redeker uh, divided it pricrusus and concrusus and sucrusus. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's in more detail. So, my question is that, uh, yeah, I'd like to hear, uh, listen to your opinion about that. Yeah, what do you think about that? Can you briefly respond to the different cursus? Thank you. Yes, 
uh, concursus or concurrence is essentially a description of causality. Um, so uh, it's not necessarily a chronological description. Uh, and when we come to Thomas Aquinas, who is the fountainhead of these uh, formulations in his doctrine of creation, uh, we see uh, that the, uh, the effects don't necessarily have to follow the cause in time. This is part of his account of creatio ex nihilo. Um, so I think I would, I would agree with you that uh, this is a description of causality rather than temporality. Well, thank you for the response and for the responses and um, have a nice time in Brisbane. It was good to have you with us and we know that you're watching us as far as possible for the rest of the conference. Thank you. Our next speaker does not need much introduction. It is George Harding. Let me say the treasurer of the heritage of Neo-Calvinism. Thank you for organizing our conference and we are very curious what you want to share with us because you promised us some pictures already. And uh, to avoid the Dutchism, the floor is yours. I only hear Dutch people say that on international conferences. I would like to do it the American way this morning. So please join me in welcoming George Haring to speak to us. Thank you, uh, Hank. Um, <clears throat> I'm glad you welcomed me so warmly, otherwise I hadn't dared to stand here. <clears throat> the correspondence of Herman Bavink. Our knowledge of Herman Bavink as a person relies for the most part on what he wrote. That is, what text he published in newspapers, magazines, journals, volumes, series, and monographs. For a smaller part, we know about him thanks to the observations by contemporaries and also thanks to the obituaries and the recollections of him that people wrote down after he had died in 1921. These are all public sources available now for about a century. The impression we have from his person, thanks to these sources, is of a reflective mind with a balanced character. I don't think the awarded biography by James Eglinton has changed this picture fundamentally. We know more about his unsuccessful love affair with Amelia Den Decker, for example, his ups and especially his downs, all thanks <coughs> to Bavink's personal diary. In this diary, we learn quite a lot about his personal life and also more about his family relations, but not much about his inner life. And another restriction, most of the notes in his diary are in telegram style and did not leave much room for comments or reflections. So, though we know more now about his personal life, thanks to the diaries, the information is still rather limited. And it does not really change the overall picture. The lack of sources about his personal and inner life contrasts with what we know about his father, Jan Bavink, who lived from 1826 till 1909. We have a few letters of Jan Bavink and some publications, but they have not been researched intensely. But he wrote an autobiography, not in telegram style, but as a life story, full of anecdotes and also with reflections and giving insights in Jan's inner life. 
So when comparing Jan Bavink to his eldest son Herman, the difference is striking. Unlike in Herman's case, we don't know much about Jan's publications, but we have a full entrance to Jan's inner life. One of the main reasons that we know so much about the person Jan Bavink is that he had a life after his retirement. In 1900, after a ministry of more than 50 years, which he spent more than half of the time here in Kampen, the emeritus status was granted to him with honor. The same year, his wife, Gesina Magdalena Holland, died, 73 years of age. Two years later, he joined Herman Bavink when he moved to Amsterdam and then found plenty of time to write his autobiography. For he died in 1909, 83 years old. Herman must have seen his father working on his autobiography. Herman Bavink, however, did not enjoy a retirement. He fell ill in August 1920, 65 years old, in the midst of his busy life at the university in politics and politics. He did not recover and died one year later. His life ended abruptly. The similarity between the father and the son is that they both recorded events in their life, of their personal life, Jan in, in his autobiography and Herman in his diaries, but for Bavink, there was no time left to write a life story. The sudden halt to Bavink's career is not the full explanation for the lack of sources about his personal and inner life. I think Bavink never revealed much of his personal and inner life, as his diaries show. I doubt if he liked small talk. When he spoke, he wanted to talk about the subject. We know from his wife that as a person, he was quite a contrast with his Dutch-American friend, Henry Dosker, whom she described as, and I quote, a funny, convivial man who never seems to run out of humor, unquote. She wrote her daughter, Honey, that Dosker was, and I quote again, a very different kind of professor than father, unquote. As a matter of fact, Bavink may have been rather dull in daily life. He seemed to prefer books over persons. My books are my true company, he once wrote in his diary. And as Acklington wrote in, on Bavink in 1883, barred from pursuing Amelia den Decker and with the likes of Snooker Gronje and Henry Dosker only accessible by letter, Bavink surrounded himself with new conversation partners. In the prime of his life, his closest companions became a group of long-dead theologians. Hepp wrote that during his stay with Gerhardus Voss in Grand Rapids in 1892, he liked to browse in Voss' study and in his library. Hepp commented critically as if he had come to the United States for that reason. Serious study was the burning flame in Bavink's life. So, no tasty anecdotes or witty remarks. But that does not mean his personal life does not interest us. His famous publications and remarkable public role make his personal life all the more interesting. What sources do we have about Herman Baving's personal life? I would say his correspondence and his photographs. Let's first deal with the photos. Today, nothing is more common when it comes to our personal lives than photos. 
How about bathing? Have you ever realized that <coughs> we hardly have any pictures of him? The biography by Valentine Hepp from 1921 has five pictures of Bavink. And that is about it to the present day, a century later. Together with J.H. Landwehr's In Memoriam of 1921 and the pictures in Eglinton's biography, the total of the pictures of Bavink has amounted to eight. Eight. What has happened? Did photos or photo books get lost? Was Bavink shying away when a photo camera was in his neighborhood? If you compare him to Kuiper, who loved the camera, and of whom dozens of pictures cir circulated since the 1870s, or with his friend Christian Schnucker Gronje, whose recent biography only has 16 pictures of him, and in his archive in Leiden there are still more, Bavink's pictorial legacy is rather poor. But maybe it's wrong to compare him on this point with Kuiper. For how many pictures do we have of his colleagues and contemporaries like J.H. Gunning or Lucas Lindeboom? Or take Bavink's Dutch-American friend Gerhardus Voss. In 1932, Voss wrote in a letter that in the last 20 years of his life, no pictures had been taken of him. The last 20 years, when we compare this with Bavink, eight pictures covering a life of 66 years is not that bad. But I never believed this small collection was all there has been. He married in 1891. Were no pictures taken on that festive occasion? In 1894, that child Honey was born. Did they never go to a studio with her to have a baby picture taken? And think of his political career, his public lectures, his travels in Europe and twice in the United States. Were no pictures taken then? We know the wives of Voss and Bavink sent pictures to each other after their meeting in Princeton in 1908. We never found the pictures. But there must have been more. And af after several efforts, and thanks to the help of family members, I succeeded in finding some in recent months. I need my... Um As I said, there are some. Um, no. So this is the first one. It's, of course, it's, it's a rather formal microphone. Sorry. Uh, th this is the first one. Um, of course, it's a rather formal picture. So it, it's not in, in, in the house of, of Bavink. Eh? So he, he went to a photo studio. Uh, together with his daughter and wife, and they were all dressed as if it's uh, a festive occasion, uh, and uh, <coughs> the picture is taken. So I guess it's about 1907, uh, and my guess is based uh, on, on the girl, on Honey. So Honey is now, I think, maybe 14 years old or something like that. So 1906, 97, 98, and in 1907, he celebrated the fact that he was professor for 25 years. So this may have been the occasion that this picture was taken. Do you want the other mic? Uh, sorry. Yeah, may maybe that helps. Yeah, sorry. I like to walk when talking. Um, <coughs> sorry. And then the second one. I think that's the same occasion, but I'm not sure. Um, <coughs> and here you can see uh, uh, Honey. Well, she, she, she's a girl of about 14, 15 years. So I, I think this is the same occasion. And you see, Bavink looks very happy. 
He's 25 year professor now and see him smile. <coughs> Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm not very good at this. And there's a next one. Not with Henny, but still the, the same dress. Uh, <coughs> and uh, <coughs> well, he, he's also dressed the same way. Uh, he's wearing spectacles, I think, in his hand. Uh, I think it's the same occasion, the same photo studio. And here again, the same dress, the same persons. Um, again, he, he doesn't look very, uh, no, positive, what, what, what would I say, very, very happy. It's, of course, when you took a picture in those days, that was a serious moment. Eh? You did not smile on pictures. You were not expected to do this. And this, this is an interesting one because this is the first time <coughs> of the pictures we have seen that is not a formal moment. He's on a holiday, he's wearing a hat, uh, and I think his wife is on the left, I guess it's his wife, it's maybe the, the wife of the man in the middle, I don't know, uh, and Bavik is standing there and watching over the sea. This is on the south coast of the Isle of Wight, a summer holiday. Uh, <coughs> the weather is not very good, I think, but that, that's England, you know. Um, but it's, it's funny that it's, it's more informal. So this is already what we in Dutch uh, call a kiekje. This is a kiekje. So a photo just taken at the last moment. Uh, uh, and well, they, they are enjoying their holiday. And here again is a, a picture of a holiday. Uh, it's in August in Hilsum, which is in the province of Utrecht. On the, what we call the Utrechtse Heuvelrucht. So it's a very... Uh, <coughs> Uh, 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 surrounding with woods, etc., a nice place to spend your vacation in the Netherlands. But it's hard to recognize, recognize the persons on the picture, but the one in the middle with the hat, that's Herman Bavik. And then there is one more, I think, yeah. And this is, I think, in, 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 the, in, in the backyard, in my opinion, in their house in Amsterdam, at the Singel. Um, and Bavik is sitting, of course, his, his wife is sitting there and left his daughter Honey. And this is her fiancé or maybe her husband already, uh, Gerrit Ruis. I forgot an R in Gerrit. Gerrit Ruis. So these are the pictures um, that I found thanks to uh, the help of uh, family members. Um, and. Uh, yesterday there were family members of the Bavink family here in the conference and they had never seen those pictures either. So it, it, and, and well, I've, I, I had contacted them before, but no one has found pictures unless these uh, eight pictures uh, we have now. So this is something extra. So, and the interesting thing of pictures, of course, is the idea that you get closer to Bavink than in his writings, and so you can see him now. We do like photos because they seem to bring us nearer to the pictured person than anything else. But since we hardly have any focus, we have to focus on the other option to come closer to the person Herman Bavink, and that's his correspondence. If we focus on Valentine's Hep and Eglinton's biographies. Most information on Bavink's personal life has been derived either from the diaries or from letters. Letters are important for our understanding of Bavink's life and they played a large role in his life as well. This started already with his father, who in 1854, at the time of Herman's birth, wrote two letters when he was called to teach at the theological school here in Kampen. One letter was a letter of acceptance, the other was a, re a rejection. He gave both to a local student, asked him to post one of them and discard the other. Jan Bavink wrote in his autobiography, I quote, and which letter did he post? The rejection letter, no. I will not say anything about what I felt and what went 
on inside me. At the moment I learned about this outcome, I only want to say this, that I had no peace about it. Not then, and for a long time afterward. This incident determined the course of Jan Baving's life and therefore also influenced Herman Baving's. In Herman's letters, life, sorry, letters played an important role as well. In August 1883, he wrote in his diary, quote, evening at eight o'clock, I came to Kampen. At home, there was a letter for me containing nothing but my enclosed letter to Amelia den Decker, still unopened. It was love unrequited. Some years later, in 1889, Bavink, and I quote again, received an elegantly drafted letter signed by 89 of the theological school students congratulating him on the nomination at the Vrije Universiteit, but asking him to decline for the good of the school and the Christian Reformed Church. Three days after this, he also received a similar letter on behalf of the Free University st student body, asking him to come and to accept, encouraging him. Bavink kept all these letters in his archive and many other letters from students accompanying this request, which indicates that they were important to him. In 1890, he wrote the most important letter in his life. In his diary, he wrote, 4th of June, 1890, Wednesday. By letter requested permission from Mr. and Mrs. Schippers to ask for their daughter Johanna's heart and hand. This time, he was successful. The letters in his archive have never been researched systematically. Only some highlights in the letter collection have received attention. Baving's archive holds more than 900 letters. Of course, almost all letters from others addressed to him. Letters that have been published are quite a few <coughs> by Abraham Kuyper, published, oh sorry, published, oh dear, technique, I, put, I want to show this one, sorry, take some time. Published by Rolf Bremer in 1966 in this book, and there are a lot of letters uh, uh, written by Kuiper to Bavink. Well, you've seen the other pictures, um, letters uh, by Christian Snooker Gronje. Well, I'll leave it at that. Um, <coughs> um, by uh, Snooker Gronje, published by Jan de Bruyne and me in 1999, and this year again in a revised edition. Those by Gerhardus Voss, published by James T. Dennison in English translation in 2005, and the letters by Henry Dosker, published in 2017 by Wouter Kruse and me. These sources, especially Baving's correspondence with Snooker Gronje, have been used extensively by his biographers. More letters have been used in the Baving research, several of his, from his Leiden professors, and incidentally, some other letters as well. But these are all letters except the one in the Snooker Gronje correspondence, written to Bavink. Unfortunately, Bavink's part of the correspondence, his letter to friends, colleagues, and others, have not been preserved. His letters to Voss and to Dosker have not been found yet. Only Kuiper and Snooker Gronje preserved a lot of letters of Bavink, and they can be found in their archives. They kept more letters from Bavink than Bavink preserved their letters. There are, for example, 78 letters from Bavink in the Snooker Gronje archive, and only 29 from Snooker Gronje in Bavink's papers. The Bavink Kuiper correspondence shows a similar 
though with less serious disbalance. So Bavink didn't keep his letters very well. This may have to do with the fact that Bavink, Bavink was not an avid correspondent, but there is more to it. A general problem <coughs> with the letters in Bavink's archive show, many letters don't seem to have been kept by Bavink. Bavink did not pay serious attention to the archiving of, his let of the letters he received. This slide, not this slide, of course, but this slide shows an overview of the letters in his archive. As we can see, there is not a gap in the collection, time-wise. From 1873 on, there are letters from every year. But I think this list represents only a small part of the letters he must have received over the years. And look, for example, 1898, four letters. 1877, one letter. And there must have been many more letters sent to Bavink. But I th so I, th I said, I think this list represents only a smaller part of the letters he must have received. Many letters must have been thrown away. <coughs> others were kept without much reason. Uh, and again, others may have been destroyed, either by himself or on his request in the last year of his life, or later by accident or by a, on a decision by his wife or daughter. Another issue is that the topics of the letters deal with is rather one-sided. One -sided. Most of them are related to the church, theology, and uh, university. Um, <coughs> I've listed some topics here. So, for example, in 1848, there, I, I think there are about 10 letters left from 1848, and they all are on the book, The Theologie, uh, from Professor Dr. Daniel Chantepi de la Sousse. Well, so there are about 10 letters, let's say, but we know later on his, in his life he published more books, of course, and lectures, etc. Um, but there are no reactions to those publications, with one exception, and that's his book on the Vrouw. Then there are again many reactions from readers. But from all the other books and publications, there are no reactions from readers. So they must have been there, of course, but they have gone, I'm afraid. <clears throat> and what about letters from politicians? There is one letter from Hendrik Colijn, one letter from Theo Heemskerk, the prime minister, but he was the leader of the anti-revolutionary party. He was uh, the member of the Senate, so he must have had way more letters, um, but I'm afraid they are gone. Also, letters from academics, from other disciplines, like philosophy or pedagogy. Where are the letters of his family? Where are the letters from readers of his publications, as I said? Where, where are his letters from Johanna? All four main correspondents of Bavink, which are Kuiper, Snoeke, Gronje, Dosker and Vaas, sent or may have sent more letters to Bavink than have been preserved. From Dosker, Kuiper, and Snook, the Bavink archive holds about 30 letters, and from Vos, 17 letters have been preserved. Altogether, this is only 10% of the full letter collection in Bavink's archive. And as to Bavink letters, uh, letters, I already said, they are kept elsewhere. As far as we can see now, based on the first glance, Kuiper's archive holds the largest collection of Bavink's letters, about 50. And there are, more, of course, more interesting correspondents than those four. And one of the most interesting at the moment, as far as I can see, is there are 25 letters from Herman Kuiper, Herman H. Kuiper, his colleague, professor of church history at the Vrije Universiteit. None of the other professors wrote letters to Bavink. Kuiper, Herman Kuiper wrote 25 letters to Bavink. Then there are letters by Alexander de Savon in Lohman. He was involved uh, in his uh, deposement as a professor at the Vrije Universiteit, 20 by uh, <coughs> Rutgers, who, who, who was a professor at the Vrije Universiteit, so I have to exempt him. 
12 by Wildeboer, his, his, his friend from students days who also became a professor. And then when we look internationally, 10 by A.T. Robertson, 9 by James Orr, well, and I, I, I could go on, go on with this list, of course. The conclusion is we don't know much about Baving's personal life and relations. We do have a dozen of photos at the moment, but the corpus of the letters in his archive still waits to be researched. And from these letters, we may trace archives that contain letters written by Baving. So, starting in his own archive, I hope there is more to be found that will enlarge our understanding of the man whose public life is so interesting that we want to know more about his personal life. The possibilities to learn more have not been exhausted yet. Thank you. Thank you, uh, George. Um, I think we should blame the chair for running out of time all the time, but it was so interesting that I didn't want to interrupt you either. Is there anyone that has a, a question for now and that is of broader interest? Otherwise, we have George with us today, and we will go for a walk through Kampen, and we can ask him uh, personally. Again, thank you so much, uh, George. It was very interesting and great that we have some more pictures. Our next uh, and final speaker for this morning is Chil Dong Park. He is a visiting scholar at the um, Freie Universiteit, and it's an honor and privilege to have you uh, with us. You serve the Reformed Church in Korea as a pastor and uh, wrote a dissertation on a Christian's view on culture based on revelation. You are a visiting researcher at the Freie Universiteit Amsterdam since 2019, connected to the Hermann Baving Center at the VU. And um, we are eager to hear your um, presentation because it is also something like an, um, an address a final address for your research period here in the Netherlands because you are due to, to leave at the end of this year and go back to Korea. Yeah? So please feel very welcome to share your thoughts with us. Good afternoon. First of all, I, I'd like to thank deeply Professor Dr. Panden Baiter and Professor Dr. Brinker uh, for their guide. Uh, due to their support, I have managed to finish my research, uh, which was a friend uh, in the beautiful background in Tardam. Uh, over the past uh, three years, despite uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, I would like to thank uh, for allowing uh, me to present uh, this presentation at the meaningful uh, Bavink Centennial Congress. Mm. I'd like to start uh, by giving Bavink's overall a view of the relationship, uh, base, and knowledge. The restriction of science to the uh, phenomenal world drives those who still want to maintain the reality of religion 
a complete separation of faith and knowledge. In this dualism, uh, one is then led to choose the origin of religion, either of Sulaiman's feeling or Kant Moray consciousness. A ritual take is stand firmly against the former and for the later. Uh, from Babinck's day to the present, while conservative and uh, liberal uh, Protestantism has respectively emphasized propositional and practical uh, side, uh, it is not difficult to, to see that uh, some denominations around us take the position of pietism that uh, theology is not a science but an academic statement of union and fellowship with Christ. Uh, Bob Ingalls is known uh, for his critique uh, of the separation and uh, faith and knowledge on the various theologies uh, are concluded both uh, in the essential element of Christianity in his work, Hurt Christendom, and in the content and purpose of special revelation in Reformed Dogma Bearing. Therefore, by synthesizing uh, these two, we can uh, integratively view the objective, subjective, and practical aspect and their uh, relationship on the base in the deity of Christ. For example, when Babinck uh, evaluates that ritual completely separate faith and knowledge, uh, the content of Babinck's criticism on ritual's functional Christology is almost found uh, in the historical aspect of special revelation in reformed dogma merit, uh, in the objective content of Christianity in a uh, Christendom. Uh, Babinck did not uh, leave any separate uh, work related to the integrative view on faith and knowledge of the deity of Christ. However, he remained many different uh, and broad views related to this. I classify this view uh, into several categories by relating the four functional aspects of special revelation uh, to the three uh, essential aspects of Christianity. And uh, I will present uh, his view on each category as a norm for evaluating the relevant view, views uh, between faith and knowledge on the deity of Christ. Uh, this is the content of the paper. I will explore first as, as a background the importance of faith in the deity of Christ, and second, the foundation of an uh, integrative view as Christological integration. Third, a norm in the integrative perspective category in which we can see the relevant content of Christ's deity integratively. Uh, next, uh, it is the importance of uh, Christ's deity and uh, Christ's place in Christianity. By connecting the deity of Christ to Christ's place in Christianity, Babinko reveals that the, this place of Christ is the distinct difference between all other religions and theologies of other viewpoints. It is mainly found in his three writings on the on the essence of Christianity. Concerning Babinko's central idea of the praise of Christ, Christ uh, Christ's uh, unique praise in Christianity as the, as the essence of Christianity means that Christ is the subject, the object, the content of Christianity and the gospel. This praise of Christ in Christianity is possible only when Christ is ontologically God. 
Christ's place in Christianity, which is based on the theory of Christ, serves as a, as a norm uh, for, uh, for the evaluation of all views of Christ and Christology. When Babink evaluated the various Christologies of the time, Babink rejected a different point of view on Christ's deity. If Christ is not ontologically God, no matter how high Christ may be placed, there is no any Christology because Christ can neither in his person nor in his work be the content and object of the Christ Christian faith. For Barbink, the distinct features of the place of Christ in Christianity, which is based on the deity Christ, becomes more apparent compared to other religions. Therefore, the deity of Christ faith in it have an absolute character by the very nature. Uh, Barbink repeatedly emphasizes uh, this uh, and antithesis by using his words, absolutely antithesis in all three his writings in the essence of Christianity. Uh, here it is worth noting that Babinka included the whole of the, his work, uh, a Christian worldview as the requirement for response of response to a supernaturalistic worldview. According to Babink, the battle today is no longer any, uh, about any tradition or any doctrine, but about whether there is still some authority and some law to which the human being is bound. In conclusion, uh, the antithetical nature of the theology of Christ leads us to consider the struggles of the spirit of the, this age, and therefore, beyond uh, maintaining some traditional doctrines of the theology of Christ, it requires a response in all areas of life with, uh, uh, with Christ-centered supernaturalistic worldview. This worldview is universal in right of human nature and world. History and at the center is the universality of the uh, mediator of the... Um, next, uh, I should like to present uh, uh, the, uh, the uni universality of Christ as a, a Christological integration, as a basis uh, for the integration of faith and knowledge on Christ. Although the content, the content of uh, Christ's mediatorship is important as a basic basis for the unity, the unity of knowledge and faith in Christ's deity. Uh, I will only briefly mention it here. If the deity of Christ is true, uh, is not worthy uh, that Christ is alive, continues to work before the incarnation and now. Babink related the deity of Christ, which is derived from the incarnation and the uh, mediator of the covenant in the work of Christ. Uh, Christ uh, has already prepared and carried out the work necessary for the incarnation from the Old Testament, uh, time and eternity. For Babink, uh, this view of the deity of Christ is centered on the uh, concept of uh, eternal and universal mediator, from which Christ's place in, uh, in the history of salvation is identified, by which we can see the overcoming of all divisions and conflict in Christ as the one mediatorship 
of cre uh, creation and redemption. Uh, Christ is not the mediation of creation and redemption, but also the mediation of the unity after the uh, consummation of the world, which is mentioned in the last part of the work of Christ in his reformed dogmatic. Therefore, Christ is the eternal uh, medi uh, mediation mediatorship of creation, redemption, and un unity. Uh, it is founded on three persons and one God, and universality of Christ as the mediator, uh, the uni universality of the mediator includes three sides. I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, without the uh, PPT, I, I, I'm going to uh, proceed my uh, presentation without the PPT. Uh, it's, uh, uh, there is uh, some error. The universality of the mediator includes three sides. Uh, first, uh, the fulfillment of the universal mediator idea in all religions. Second, the universality of Christ from his uh, uh, divine nature, uh, God's self-communicability such as the generation of the Son, by which creation and the incarnation of God are pro a part of it. Uh, so the, the universality of Christ from his human nature, uh, Christ assumed the perfect hum uh, humanity. It is well known uh, what cannot be taken, uh, cannot be cured. From this point of view, uh, there are God decree and sword creation as the embodiment of God's thought, the divine wisdom of Christ in it, uh, and the role of the Logos. These unite heaven and earth, matter and uh, spirit, spiritual world and spiritual, uh, present world and spiritual world. Moreover, it is the basis for uh, the unity of the uh, epistemological, ontological, ethical uh, opposition, which is uh, demonstrated in his book, uh, Christian Worldview. Uh, the essence of uh, faith determines the methodology and characteristics of theology. Fabinko treated uh, as uh, this uh, as uh, uh, theology and methodology in the inner principle of uh, theology in reform dogmatic. As mentioned earlier, Babinko norms for his critical uh, for the separation of faith and knowledge uh, of the various theologies are found in the three essential elements of Christianity, in you know, Christendom, and the content of purpose of special revelation in Reformed dogmatics. There are uh, synthesizing these two, we can integratively view the objective, subjective, and practical aspect uh, 
uh, and their relationship on the uh, faith in the deity of Christ. Uh, I'm very sorry. Uh, uh, this is the, the uh, three essential of Christianity. You know, Christianity includes uh, uh, the objective, subjective, and uh, scientific aspect. Next, uh, this is the content of purpose of special revelation. Uh, this is uh, the historical. Uh, organic, holy person, and uh, soteriological aspect. Uh, this is the unified category model, the grid where the X, Y axis meet falls under the each category. Uh, it first uh, consider the, the objective, subjective, and scientific aspect of Christianity as, as uh, uh, Y axis. And then this in detail uh, with the historical, organic, whole person, and satanic uh, aspect of special revelation as X axis. Each of these content is association associated with the norm of an integrative view of, of faith and knowledge. Uh, let us take a closer look at each grid. Considering the objective aspect of Christianity and all aspects of special revelation, uh, Babinka's related perspective is presented as an important of present place and work of Christ in, in the history of salvation. Second, the starting point and, and the task, task of the theology. Third, the road, the road ship of the Christ. I like to explain only the first element. Uh, Christ is not the origin, uh, nor I the consummant, uh, but in the middle of history. Christ is the mediator of God and man, and therefore point from himself back to the Father just as he pointed forward to the future. By forwarding out the Holy Spirit, the church can realize these wonderful works of God, boasting in it and giving thanks and praise to God. Concerning other grid, I will omit the, the detail and present only the uh, title. Uh, concerning the, the objective aspect of Christianity and the historical aspect of special revelation, uh, there are the gradual notes of revelation. Uh, revelation is gradually given and is completely, 
completed only in uh, Christ. Uh, from this view, Babink argues uh, historical Jesus and apostolic Christ is the same. Uh, other grid uh, represent uh, each appreciate more. Uh, as the last thing, it is the relationship objective, subjective, and uh, applicable aspect. For Babinko, concerning the relationship objective and subjective revelation, uh, the subjective aspect uh, is uh, reflection as an effect of the uh, objective revelation. Uh, the applicable aspect, although ethics is fundamental, result from both subjective and objective revelation. Babinko strongly emphasizes the significance of objective revelation. Although Babinko highly value, valued uh, Shulaimar's feelings of absolute defense, the, uh, dependence, as the essence of religion. However, he opposed the uh, subjectivism that theology treats religious experience scientific, scientifically. But Babinko, uh, uh, for Babinko, objective revelation is the object of uh, theology. In his work, Christ and Christianity, he acknowledged the face of Christ itself is an is anthropomorphic and subjective. However, however uh, Babinko stressed that the objective theological side of the, this space bears the importance of determining an authenticity of the whole face. In conclusion, here is the norm. Uh, uh, here is the norms is uh, equivalent uh, uh, to the counterweight role used by Babinka in the problem of problem of uh, Pelagianism. Although the uh, Roman Catholics and Lutheran had many errors associated with uh, Pelagianism, uh, nevertheless uh, they still possess a uh, Counterweight in their clear and firm confession of the Trinity, the deity Christ and uh, satisfaction, so that the Pelagian principle could not exert its influence unhindered. In contrast, in the case of Socinian, who rejected all these objective dogma soon after they departed from the essence of Christianity. Uh, personally, when I gave a special sermon uh, in South Korea uh, and lectured online for missionaries who were teaching uh, with the content related to today's topic uh, in the uh, in first half of this year, Babinko theology has given me great insight uh, for both church and theology. I hope that Babinko theology and pious will have a more positive impact on the church and theology. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this with us and we all admire your persistence. Um, it was a little bit difficult with the, with the technique and so on, but uh, Great. There's only room for just one question, I suggest. Is there anyone that wants to respond or ask something? Okay. 
No one in the audience? Okay. Well, then I suggest that it is time to have uh, lunch together. And after lunch, we will be guided in a city walk to Bavings houses. I hope that it's only in Kampen and not in Amsterdam, um, Gert, otherwise we won't make it in time. We're looking forward to that, and maybe it's nice to, if you allow me to say grace together for the, for the lunch. So I will lead you in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your gifts, for the fellowship, for what we have heard, le heard and learned from each other. We thank you for your blessings. We pray for those who are in difficult circumstances worldwide. We also think of the pandemic and all the concerns for the future. Lord, be with them that bear responsibility and authority to guide us as a nation and worldwide. We pray for the food and drink that we receive from your hand and for your blessing for the rest of this day. In Jesus' name, amen. It's Magelijk.
So, we've the opened the meeting. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. And I can hear you also, so that's, that's good. That's perfectly. Yep. Uh, when it's your turn, it's, uh, it's about uh, 45 minutes, I believe. About an hour. Yes. Yeah, yeah I will. Yeah, I'll print uh, at uh, 2.30. Yeah. You can, uh, you can leave the meeting open. I put the sound uh, out here so nobody hears you. And uh, uh, speak uh, calm and, uh, and then it will go, go all right, I think. Mm. Yes, for this moment, it's, uh, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I, I, see, I see you later. Slide. So, can I share the screen? Uh, it should be possible, but... Yeah, I think it should be... Should it be workable? But we can test it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, and I share screen. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Hold on. Okay, again. Uh. I don't see a share screen yet. I don't see any movement anymore. I don't know if you're in yet. Yeah, yes. Yeah, I share my screen. Uh, we don't see anything happens yet. Only uh, Can you can you see my screen? No, I don't see your screen, and your your picture is uh, standing still at the moment. So there's no movement more in in your picture. Okay. Uh, okay. Hmm. You. Uh, uh, can you can you see now? No, I don't see you. I, I see you, but uh, no movement and no shared screen. Okay, I have shared screen, and uh, yeah. on my laptop, it shows uh, it shows it has been shared. Yeah, but we don't see it here. I don't. Again. Perhaps I, I, I stop sharing first, and. Then yeah. Uh, I share it again. Okay, can you see it now? No, I don't see it. Uh, is, is it a PowerPoint presentation? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, let's see how we, uh, how we can show that. It's a little bit. Ah, oh, now you are. Can you see it now? No, no. Uh, your picture is uh, away. It's black now. I still hear you, but no picture. Okay. Uh, it's it's. Oh. Uh, ah, no, I see it. No, I see. It. Now I see you, and the PowerPoint. Okay, now. Yeah. Uh, so can you it's can you see, yes. see my slide? 
I can I can show you uh, how it's uh, it's uh, is pictured here. Yeah. Uh, look, it's like this now. Okay. Yeah. When you're speaking, you don't see our picture. You don't see the church, but you see your own picture. And when uh, someone in the church ans uh. answers you, oh, that's a also the, it's a different position. But. Okay, so, yeah, so like this one? This is better, I think, I think, yeah. Okay, yeah. And, uh, oh, cool, yeah. I do it. So, uh, now I, now I change my slides. Yeah. Yes, it yeah, pretty so, good. Looks okay, so, this way. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. This, this will work. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool. Yeah. Oh. So. Yeah. 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 I think uh, we uh, should uh, leave it uh, this way, and uh, your uh, sound is loud and clearly, so that's no problem. Yeah. So I now stop presenting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. This will work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cool. yeah. Yeah. So do I need to uh do I, do I need to close the yeah. this meeting? You leave the meeting at the moment? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank so, you. See you later. See you later.
Yes. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Please, would you all take seats again? Then we can make a start with the afternoon session. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, in the afternoon session of this second day of the conference. And uh, <coughs> we start this session with a lecture by uh, James Eglinton. James earned his PhD at the University of Edinburgh and is Meldrum Senior Lecturer in Reformed Theology at the University of Edinburgh. He worked here formerly as a researcher at the the Theologus Universiteit Kampen. And, of course, we all know his most recent book, The Biography of Bavink, Bavink, A Critical Biography. That biography won the Gospel Coalition Book of the Year Prize for History and Biography in 2020, last year. And he also was a finalist with this book in the ECPA Christian Books Awards in this year, 2021. His other books, earlier published, include Trinity and Organism, his dissertation, Herman Bavink on the Preaching and Preachers, Neo-Calvinism and the French Revolution, Christian and Christian Worldview. And he writes regular opinion pieces in Great Britain on religion and public life for, amongst others, The Times and The Herald newspapers. James, the floor is yours and I will read the title of your presentation, which is Herman Bavink's Western World of Faith, a problem solved by J.H. Bavink, question mark. The floor is yours. Thank you, George. Um, so, George just read my paper's title, Herman Bavink's Western, in parentheses, World of Faith a problem solved by J. H. Bavink. The conference title, the conference itself is, or at least it was when the call for papers went out, the conference title is Bavink's World of Faith, the value of religious difference in religious cultures and secular societies. So the title of my paper is a play on that, not just Bavink's World of Faith, but Bavink's Western World of Faith. And in this paper, I want to explore one particular tension in Herman Bavink's thought, um, particularly as it relates to the idea of the world and Christianity and big ideas like Christianity as a world faith, or in Bavink's own terms, a Catholic faith. Uh, the, the tension that I am dealing with in Herman Bavink is the tension between a group of related ideas that are very well known in Bavink's thought and will be known, known to you if you've read him before, ideas that are all universal in scope, like general revelation or common grace uh, or the idea of Catholicity. Those ideas on the one hand are all ideas relating to the universal in Christianity, but the tension in, in Herman Bavink that I'm addressing is the tension between those universal ideas and another set of ideas for him that are also very important uh, around locality, the specific places where Christianity exists, where it occurs and develops. And there I'm talking specifically about Western culture um, and about uh, colonialism, the export of Western culture alongside Western Christianity. 
And we already heard a, a very good paper from Bruce Pass on this earlier on. Um, I'm dealing with a related topic, uh, not so much focusing on colonialism, uh, but I'm focusing on um, the tension between, uh, what, well, Bruce spoke about colonialism, evangelism, and providence. I'm not thinking about providence in my paper. I'm thinking about colonialism, evangelism, and these universal ideas, Catholicity, general revelation, um, and common grace. And I think that there is an unresolved tension in Herman Bavinck's thoughts on these two poles between the universal and the particular, or the, the, the Catholic or the common and the local. And I think that, um, that another Bavinck actually has a very good effort at solving this problem, and that is his nephew, the missiologist, Johann Hermann Bavinck. So I'll be setting out Hermann Bavinck in the first place and this tension and then introducing the way that I think Johann Hermann Bavinck tries to solve the tension or ease the tension. So in, in Hermann Bavinck's lecture in 1885, the lecture on the Catholicity of Christianity and the church, he argued that the Protestant Reformation did introduce uh, sectarianism and fragmentation within the church. Um, but at the same time, it was also based on a rediscovery of the true nature of Catholicity. This rediscovery for Bavinck meant the rejection of a dualistic Roman Catholic view of nature and grace, in Bavinck's view, through which, and I quote him, according to Rome, Christianity is exclusively church. Everything depends on this. Outside the church is the sphere of the unholy, end quote. In rejecting the view that Catholicity is a churchly idea, it's the church that is Catholic, but not the world that we think of in Catholic terms. In rejecting that view, Bavinck said that Protestants gain a new perspective on the world and a life within the world. Protestantism, he said, drew sin and grace into a sharper opposition than Roman Catholicism had. And by doing this, he thought, Protestant theology argued that sin had a pervasive and a corrosive spread across the entirety of human life, and accordingly, that the Christian faith presented God's solution to that problem of sin across the entirety of human life. So he said that Protestant theology articulates Christianity as a faith for all of life in the world and for the entirety of that life in a distinctive way, in a Protestant way. So Protestant Catholicity is the view that the gospel is good news for all of life, not simply for the church, but for, in Bavinck's terms, the whole groaning creation. And in his view, this was a major departure from Roman Catholicism. I quote Bavinck again, Rome thus maintains the Catholicity of the Christian faith in the sense that it seeks to bring the entire world under the submission of the church, but it denies Catholicity in the sense that the Christian faith itself must be a leavening agent in everything, end quote. So there is a change in the Protestant Reformation towards a culturally universal sense of Catholicity but for Bavinck, that's not anti-ecclesial. So you, it's not that the Catholicity pertains to only culture and not church, rather Catholicity uh, covers everything. So his insistence is that Christianity is Catholic with regard to the totality of human cultures and historical periods. And this goes along with a distinct view of the Catholicity of the church itself. And I quote Bavinck again, it is impossible to express the thoroughgoing universalism of the Christian faith in words more powerful and beautiful than these. Christianity knows no boundaries beyond those which God himself has in his good pleasure established. No boundaries of race or age, class or status, nationality or language. A gospel so rich created a people of God that could no longer be contained within the boundaries of one nation and country. The cross of Christ reconciles all things, God and humanity, 
heaven and earth, Jew and Gentile, barbarian and Scythian, man and woman, slave and free. On Pentecost, the New Testament church is born as an independent community." End quote. This idea of Catholicity requires the church to have no ethnic, uh, geographical, or cultural center point on earth. Rather, it subjects the church to geographical decentralization. It's Catholic because it does not have a center point in any one human culture. And on these Protestant terms, Catholicity prevents any single human culture or a single cultural expression of Christianity from the privilege of being made the norm. The way that it's done in this place is the norm for how it should be everywhere. And this is a, an early view in Babink in 1885. Later, in the second edition of the Reformed Dogmatics, we still find the same insistence that um, he has this memorable critique um, that the combination of Roman and Catholic is, is an oxymoron. Uh, these words, he said, are mutually contradictory, and I quote him, the Roman Catholic Church makes the faith and salvation of humans dependent on a specific place and on a specific person, and thereby fails to do justice to the Catholicity of Christianity. The name Roman, or Papal Church, therefore expresses its nature much more accurately than Catholic. Now, of course, the, the Roman Catholic Church is obviously a truly global institution, and Bavink recognizes that fact. But the way in which it privileges a particular human culture in the midst of all the cultures of the world makes it stand out to Bavink as not Catholic enough. It could become more Catholic by ditching the Roman label or the the, nor the normative privilege given to one place. Protestantism, Bavink thought, um, fights sin uh, in the natural order more strenuously than Catholicism because Protestants see the good in the natural order in a different way. Every square inch of human life is worth fighting against sin for because Christianity is Catholic also in a cultural sense. Even in, in Bavink's earliest writings, uh, we find a Protestant account of Catholicity as geographically decentralized, and that in theory at least is connected to ideas like the common grace of God as present in all human cultures, and all humans being subject to the same general revelation of God. Because Christianity is Catholic, therefore, it's able to take root in and blossom within and also reform every distinct human culture. So it's not, it, it wouldn't be Catholic if it were only a Western faith for Western people and Western culture, if it couldn't spread elsewhere. It has to be able to spread anywhere in order to be what it is, to be Catholic. Now, Bavink was very clearly aware that the Western world contained many different cultural histories. He knew the locality of his own Dutch Reformed tradition amongst other Western cultures. In contrast to Kuiper, who was very ambitious for the global influence in the future of Dutch Calvinism, Bavink was much more modest. He said that Calvinism promotes multiformity and no local Reformed church should be, quote, supplanted or corrupted by foreign ideas. Although he believed that the Netherlands needed Calvinism, his views on his local tradition's international prospects contradicted Kuiper's hopes. Bavink wrote, nobody can tell whether Dutch Calvinism is still destined to exert influence on the future of Calvinism in other countries. These views, I think, shed important light on one of Bavink's most memorable claims so in 1892, after his journey to North America, Bavink argued that rather than the Dutch exporting their, their Dutch Calvinism to America, the Dutch should encourage America to develop its own distinctive form of Christianity. And these speeches back in the Netherlands closed with the locally controversial claim that after all, Calvinism is not the only truth. 
the United States was a, or North America was a melting pot fed by a range of different Western cultural histories and forms of Christianity. So American Christianity needed to be conditioned by the norms of Scandinavian Lutherans, English Puritans and Methodists, Scottish Presbyterians, and so on. But simply to project Dutchness onto it, onto its development, um, to channel its development in a Dutch way would be wrong, precisely because it's a foreign imposition. And you also see related to this in Bavink's critiques of forms of secularism and atheism in Dutch culture, his own organicist thought often draws on the, the image of the invasive non-native species and a careful attentiveness to the flowers that grow uh, natively in your own terrain, in your own soil. And the same kind of idea um, influences his reluctance to plant Dutch tulips elsewhere in the West. Other flowers grow there. Now, the young Bavink paid little attention to the specifics of how Christianity might spread in the non-Western world. Although from early on, he has laid a clear foundation in these universal ideas um, for this truly Catholic faith to show that it's Catholic by blooming in whichever cultural soil it's, it's planted in. But those questions about how Christianity spreads in the non-Western world become more significant later in his life. In 1908, when he returned to North America, he encountered this global missions movement, a global evangelization project, and he was influenced by it. And then he comes back to the Netherlands and becomes a prominent supporter of missiology as a development. Um, he, um, he develops personal contact with missionaries who are working in, uh, outside the Western world in, in Japan and in other places. And he encouraged young Dutch Christians to move into the mission field. In 1911, uh, as we've heard already today, he was elected a, a member of parliament, a role that he took on just as the Dutch colonial project is wrestling with questions that are prompted by uh, late modern secularization. Um, what should the export of Dutch culture look like? Um, and, and how explicitly Christian should it be? Uh, can we share our culture without, without also sharing our religion? or should our, cult, our, our colonial project aim to share both? In two parliamentary speeches, two notable speeches, Bavink argued for the disastrous effects of a secularized export of Western culture without also Western Christianity. His claim was that if you teach non-Western people a Western view of culture and economics and science without also sharing Christianity with them, um, you, you kill off their ancestral religion, um, but you don't give them a new faith to take its place. If you take an animist and teach that person Western biology, you automatically pull the rug out from under their feet in terms of their, uh, their world and life view. And if you don't replace that um, with the faith that corresponds to the science that you've taught that person, to the, the Western biology, then Bavink argued, you impoverish that person. You, you, take far more than you give in that colonial exchange. And the long-term effect of that kind of secularized colonialism, he thought, would be that in a generation or two, when people realize what this has cost them, when indigenous people realize what it has cost them, all that has been taken from them and how little they've been given back and only part of Western culture being given to them, they will return to their ancestral religions but they will return to them in a, in a focused anti-Western way. So non-Western religions will morph into anti-Western majority world religions. So the future was global, religiously fueled anti-Western warfare. And this is why his speeches argue passionately for the West exporting both its culture in a broader sense and its religion to the non-Western worlds. And I, I agree with Bruce's paper earlier that for Bavink, for Herman, those things are uh, th those things are really tightly interwoven, and that he, I don't think he imagines enough um, how you might separate the two to make them independent. I think that he tries to show the, the distinction between the two things to highlight that if you don't have missionaries going, if you just have colonizers uh, fueled by capitalism on its own, without Christianity as a leavening influence, then you get a very different kind of colonial project. And that's why for him, 
you have to have missionaries going as well and also supported by the, the state. Now, concretely, um, in, in the mature Mavinck's thought, uh, the best outcome for Dutch colonial subjects was that they would uh, rapidly acquire Western culture and religion, um, which, as we've heard again from Bruce, um, he believed in God's providence were more highly developed, thanks to the leavening influence of Christianity, more highly developed than the cultural and religious development of the non-Western world. In one of these parliamentary speeches, He's, he beams with paternalistic pride about a Javan who now worships Christ and who reveres the Dutch queen. So the best thing for a Javan there is to become not only a Christian, but a quasi Nederlander. Um, in my view, I think Bavink was aware that although he has certain reasons for why this colonial project makes sense to him, and I think Bruce explained that very well earlier in terms of providence and a sense of duty to the rest of the world for the the blessings of Christianity leavening Western culture and elevating it to be a civilization and so on. Although Bavink has certain ways to justify this, I think that he was also aware that this, uh, that this didn't sit easily with the other constellation of ideas that I mentioned at the beginning, these universal ideas around common grace and general revelation um, and Catholicity. And I think that this is why in his mature years, we see repeated efforts to appoint a specialist to go beyond him in thinking these issues through as the 20th century progresses. So he becomes an active supporter for a new chair in missiology at the FU. Uh, he recognized that someone else needed to develop this aspect of reformed theology or Catholicity in the reformed tradition. Someone else has to explore the relationship of Catholicity to the localities in which Christianity takes root, both in the West and the non-Western world. And as the story progresses, uh, we find Johann Hermann Bavink, his nephew, appearing, and who takes up this baton. Now, Johann was born in 1895, and he lived until 1964. He worked on, on Java in two distinct periods, and he also pastored in the Netherlands. Um, he taught in Kampen here, and also in Amsterdam. Now, in contrast to um, Herman's uh, utterly Western sense of self, uh, historical location, Johann Herman once described himself as having, and I quote, been born with an Eastern soul. When he lived on Java, one of the nicknames he had was the White Javanese. He even published theological literature in Javanese under a Javanese pen name. Um, and he tried to embed himself thoroughly in non-Western culture, even to the point of having a non-Western name that he worked under. He was not simply a, a crude post-colonial reaction to his colonial era uncle. Rather, I think that Johann Hermann was a very sophisticated thinker in his own rights who attempted to resolve this particular tension in his uncle's thoughts uh, regarding Catholicity and culture. And I think that he tried to do this by grounding the tension in the life and the thoughts and the story of a much earlier figure, uh, Augustine of Hippo, who for J.H. Bavink provides a fourth century bridge through Africa in order to ease this tension in thinking about West and East. Now, Herman, of course, was also profoundly influenced by Augustine. He's the most cited theologian across the Reformed dogmatics. But in comparison to the way that Augustine is used in Hermann's writings, I think that Johann Hermann uses Augustine distinctly in two ways. In the first place, uh, the notion of the paradox, uh, the paradox taken from Augustine's confessions, plays a governing role, I think, uh, right across J.H. Bavinck's works. It's an, it's an existential motif that runs through Augustine's autobiography in the Confessions, um, that, that is, uh, it has an enormous explanatory power in J.H.'s writings, and it's the existential motif of how all human lives, Augustine's own as well, um, are simultaneously a looking for and a not looking for God, or a, a fleeing towards and a fleeing away from God, and the paradox is that these happen at the same time, or for J.H., yeah, he uses the imagery of hands a lot. So every human being constantly uses one hand to pull himself or herself closer to God, but with the other hand, he's always pushing God away 
you know, so you kind of you, you could reach out to touch the face of God, but it's always to so that you can evade Him. Um, and this psychological insight serves as the lens that J. H. uses in developing a sympathetic but critical reading of religious philosophers in the East and the West. And, and it all goes back to Augustine. Now, there's a well-established Western view of Augustine as a universal man, um, and who, someone whose story compels all Western people because it's so existentially relatable to subsequent generations of Westerners. But J. H. Bavinck viewed Augustine's universal man appeal uh, not simply as the first modern man, as we hear him described in uh, Peter Brown and various others, Augustine scholars. He's not just the first Westerner. Uh, he's, he, for J. H., Augustine has a universal appeal and, and that's global. He's no less relevant to the peoples of the East, whose lives are also part of this paradox of seeking but not seeking God. Uh, and I think if we compare J.H. to Herman, um, for J.H. we find this reliance on existential Augustinian psychological factors to provide a way to relate the universal and the local. Um, that's quite different to Herman, um, in that Herman tries to establish universal ways of thinking about Christianity through um, interrelated theological ideas like common grace, general revelation, the fallenness of humans and sin. And this accounts for the particulars of universal human religiosity. But I think in, in Johann Hermann's work, the Augustinian paradox is used differently. Um, Hermann's work on psychology, especially the unconscious life and personality was developed in Augustine's shadow. But I think in comparison to this, the Augustinian psychological paradox um, takes on a different role in J. H. Bavinck's work. It becomes a Christian entry point into non-Western cultures. It becomes an entry point into Christianity for non-Western people. So it's a bridge that you can cross from either side. And in this way, Augustine is this African bridge between East and West. So rather than taking the kind of approach that Herman's uh, universal Christian uh, explanation requires to explain Christianity to non-Western people, which is you have to begin by telling them how they are, how you have a universal, universal humanity on, the, on Christian terms, like the basic structures of monotheism. So there is only one God and you live uh, experiencing that one God's general revelation and you have fallen into sin and I will use that to explain your religion and your culture to you on my religion's terms, instead of taking that kind of approach, using ideas like common grace or general revelation, Johann Hermann seems to have preferred a different first point of con contact, which is this Augustinian psychological paradox. So that's the, the first point where I think that he's quite distinctive. Secondly, J.H.'s writings um, show a specific readiness to explain the development of Western culture uh, to a single figure, a single person, and that's Augustine, rather than to Christianity in general terms. So Herman talks about Christianity as creating Western culture, um, Christianity in a very broad sense. Um, we are all the, the product of that, and Western culture is a fruit of Christianity. So you find in Herman's parliamentary speeches the claim that modern Western culture is the fruit of Christianity, and therefore we should export not only the fruit, but also the root, Christianity, and its culture. Uh, instead, Johann Hermann um, personalizes that claim. It's not just Christianity in general. It's one person who created the Western world. So the architect of the West is Augustine. And uh, so it's, it's like a butterfly effect view of Western history. There's one, there's one um, caterpillar that goes into a chrysalis, and then he comes out, and it's Augustine, and he flaps his wings, and the butterfly effect of that goes on and on and on, and it gives us Western culture. But Augustine is the butterfly there. Um, so for Johann Hermann, he can say that the 20th century West is inexplicable without Christianity, but its long, slow Christianization was a specific consequence of Augustine and his life and work. In Johann Hermann's view, um, Augustine's works like the Confessions and On the Trinity uh, 
really change everything. They change the world. The Confessions creates a new awareness of human psychology and the striving to move from the self towards God. Um, so it gives you a, a new way to think about anthropology. What does it mean to be a human as a psychological subject? Um, and to realize that your world isn't governed by uh, blind fate or chaos, but there is actually, a, above all, there's a God who seeks you. Uh, so the Confessions changes how we think about humanity, and on the Trinity changes how we think about metaphysics, about ultimate reality. Uh, it shows us that we should think about those things not in cosmological terms, but in theological terms, that God speaks to us. God shows uh, himself to us. So with these, J.H. argues, Augustine creates the Western world. Um, he gives birth to a new world, and that's the world in which Western people live. So he is the seminal figure whose own existential, cultural, intellectual conversion to Christianity was the single most important thing in the shaping of what then emerges as Christianized Western culture. J.H. argues that Augustine reshaped the world around the Mediterranean um, before it was the West, from its pre-Christian cosmological world order into the novel theological world order that followed. So the world becomes a completely different place through Christianity, and that creates the West. So Augustine becomes the progenitor of Western culture, but not a figure who is formed by Western culture or within Western culture. So in this reading, while all Western culture is indebted to Augustine, Augustine is nonetheless um, a primordial, non-Western point of origin. But Augustine isn't born in the West. He invents it. He grew up wrestling with a pre-Western world, with pagan cultures and religions that predated Christianity. So J.H. argues, those pagans in Augustine's world are no less alien to uh, 20th century Westerners than than the Hindus or the Buddhists on Java or the animists. It, it was precisely by overcoming that pagan world that Augustine creates the thing that the West is now trying to export, its own Western culture. Now, Herman once insisted that Augustine, I quote, does not belong exclusively to Rome. I think Johann Herman amplifies that by saying he also doesn't belong exclusively to the West. Um, we are indebted to him. He's not indebted to us. So subtly, Johann Hermann invests the kind of universal capital in Augustine that Hermann had invested in the word Catholicity. And in the notion of Catholicity, Hermann thought he'd find something for everyone. But to explain it to you, he has first to, he has to bring you into a form of uh, Christian logic and reasoning. Johann Hermann thought he'd find the Catholicity in a story, in an individual, uh, and there's a point of contact for you because you're a psychological human being, or psychologically you're a human, and that's universal. Um, but each thought that they had found something for everyone, but for one it's Augustine and, and the other it's a notion of Catholicity. And from this, and I'm almost finished, um, we see an, an ability in JH to distinguish between Augustine as the Christianizing root of Western culture, and there I'm thinking in terms close to Peter Brown's description of Augustine as the first modern man. So he's the root, the Christianizing root of Western culture. And later Western civilization is the local fruit from, from that root, the local Christianized fruit that very slowly grew from Augustine's root. In contrast to Herman's belief in the West's calling as um, exporting both the root, which for Herman is gen in general terms Christianity, and the fruit, in local terms Western culture, Johann Herman rejected crudely exporting the fruit, but he argued for uh, exporting the root. Uh, Eastern people need Augustine, and they need to meet Augustine for themselves in order to discover that his strivings with his own pre-Christian, pre-Western neighbors, that striving is very recognizable in Eastern contexts, or in, in majority world contexts that don't have a historic, uh, they don't have their own Augustine. But they can have their own Augustine because he doesn't belong to the West. And from that indigenous interaction with Augustine, 
J.H. believed Christianity would start transforming the East. It will grow its own local fruit, so you don't need to plant tulips in the rainforest. Local fruit can grow there. So to Johann Hermann, there's simply no need to, you can leave your bulbs back in the Netherlands. Uh, like there, there's local seed that will grow there. Uh, you just have to plant the story of Augustine and then his world reordering power will take effect and then you grow Christianity. And it, actually in JH's own story, uh, this isn't just abstract theory, we see him engaging on Java with both Dutch colonists and local people with the message of Augustine. In February 1932, uh, the newspaper De Nederlander carried a report on a youth leaders conference held in December 1931 in, in Merapi. A conference attended by, I quote, 45 people, Bataks, Javans, Chinese, people from the Malakas were amongst those who had come from very different backgrounds. And the speaker is J.H. Bavink. And his topic, the life of Augustine. Later that year, he, in October, we also find him giving a lecture on Augustine, the seeker of the light, again to another uh, crowd in Magellan. He's well known for, amongst missiologists for his creative efforts to develop Christianity with a local flavor. And there are all kinds of interesting examples of how he tries to do this within Javanese culture, trying to subversively fulfill its, its attempt both to draw itself towards God and to push God out of the way. But I think without Augustine in the first place, we can't understand how he did so. But also without Augustine, I think we can't understand how he is trying to build on his uncle's work and move past these tensions that I sketched in the beginning between Catholicity and the ideas around it, like common grace, general revelation, and so on, and also fallenness and sin, and on the other hand, uh, the, the locality of, of human culture. I think I've probably gone a bit over time. If not, I'll stop there anyway. Thank you, uh, James, for your uh, lecture. Um, we are over time, that's true, but I will give room for one question. Is there anyone who has a pressing issue we want to bring to the table? If not, you can ask me at the next coffee break. I'm happy to talk about the paper then. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thank you, uh, James. Then we move on, and there he is already. Simeon. Simeon Xu. Um, Simeon is a postdoctoral post research fellow in theology and ethics of artificial intelligence at the School of Divinity at the University of Edinburgh. And a very warm welcome, Simeon. Can, can you hear as well? Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you, George. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> we, we are here in a church which is a large building with an echo. So I would suggest you to speak slow uh, and uh, with a little distance to your computer. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The title of the lecture is, and it's also on the screen already, Cultural Differences and the Possibility of Sino-Reformed Theology. Simeon, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, this paper seeks to bring Herman Barbing's notion of culture into dialogue with the development of reformed theology in mainland China. I will argue that with an emphasis on national differences, Barbing's view of culture is imbued with the attention to cultural differences, which can underpin the contextualization of reformed theology in mainland China. In what follows, I will first analyze Barming's notion of culture and bring into the foreground his idea of cultural differences. 
Then I tend to reform the theology in mainland China, examine its development without contextualization. Finally, I will demonstrate how Bavinck's view of cultural differences serves to develop Sino-reformed theology. Bavinck's elaboration on culture can be found in chapter nine of the philosophy of revelation. At the beginning, he sets forth the rational or Christianity's relationship with culture as follows. Based on the doctrine of creation, culture is grounded in nature and is a gift from God. Bavink then defines culture as follows, quote, culture in the broadest sense includes all the labor which human power expends on nature. To be clear, nature here carries two connotations. Firstly, nature refers to the phenomenal world that can be experienced. Secondly, it means all faculties and the powers that humans receive from God at creation. As such, nature is, quote, a means for cultivating the external world as well as an object which must be cultivated. In short, culture is a fruit of the cultivation of nature. Bavink argued that the cultivation of nature is twofold, which, give rise, uh, which gives rise to two circles of culture. To the, first, uh, to the first belong all those activities of men for the production and the distribution of material goods, such as agriculture, cattle rearing, industry, and the tree. And the second circle includes all that labor whereby man realizes objectively his ideals of the true, the good, and the beautiful by means of literature and science, justice and statecraft, works of beauty and art, and at the same time works out his own development and civilization. Three observations can be noted about this passage. First, culture needs to be construed from both the material and the spiritual perspective. The first circle of culture is related to the accumulation of material goods, whereas the second circle includes the actualization of the spiritual and the invisible ideals in visible ways. For Bali, this actualization of ideals is tied, uh, is tied up with ethical ideals and the morality, and thus can be described as ethical culture. Second, culture denotes the progress and the dynamic character of humanity, which means that culture is a continuum in history and has no absolute internal conflicts. Therefore, Bavik suggests that modern culture is grounded in the past culture. However strenuously modern culture attempts to break from the past, Bavik's emphasis here is on Western culture, and by arguing so, he turns down the suggestion that Modern Western culture conflicts with Christian faith. Bavinka does not explain whether Western and non-Western culture, such as Chinese culture, are part of the same continuum of culture. Nonetheless, the third observation can be noted here. Bavinka implies cultural differences between nations that is, while speaking of the relationship between Christianity and the culture. 
Garbinger describes the objective actualization of the human ideals of the true, the good, and the beautiful as the ethical culture of our own personality. Given this individualistic feature, human culture is not uniform around the world. Bamga does not continue to expand on the idea of cultural differences. This is because he only focuses on Western culture and its relationship with Christendom. He argues that the Christian nations are still the guardians of culture. Despite this, Bavinck's stance on the contextualization of the ecclesial confession can be used to develop a Bavinckian view of cultural differences, which can underpin the contextualization of reformed theology in mainland China. In his early article, The Veterans Heart Cycle Looping on the Kirk, Bavinck clearly states that Reformed confessions cannot be mechanically applied in the Netherlands of the 19th century. Rather, the church needs to distill the spirit and the principles from traditional Reformed confessions to meet its contemporary needs, and then use these principles to give shape to Reformed faith and life. Barming's concentration on the contextual aspects of ecclesial confessions is broadened in his later writings to range over the peculiarities of different countries. In the article, The Future of Calvinism, Barving associates the multiplicity of reformed confessions with the differences between countries. He argues that, quote, Calvinism has room for the display of individuality, for that difference in character which must exhibit itself among the various nationalities. There's a variety of gifts, and the difference of insight may not work hard, but be of advantage, end quote. Although Barbing does not mention culture here, it is doubtless that national differences have ties to their diverse cultures. The populace of a country expand their labor on nature and create their own culture. Therefore, while uh, speaking of the future of Calvinism, Barbing contends Calvinism does not demand for itself the same development in America and England, which it has found in Poland. This only must be insisted upon that in each country and in every reformed church, it should develop itself in accordance with its own nature, and should not permit itself to be supplanted or corrupted by foreign ideas. Viewed in this light, the future of Calvinism lies in that Calvinism must be contextualized in every nation and be bound up with a specific culture. That is to say, the future of reformed theology in mainland China lies in that Sino reformed theology needs to be crafted to engage with Chinese culture. Now let's look at reformed theology in mainland China. From the 1980s onwards, reformed theology grew rapidly and expanded its influence considerably. Uh, many Chinese pastors and theologians studied reformed theology in the seminaries in Western countries particularly in the Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. Of these Chinese Reformed theologians, the most well-known four scholars are Jonathan Chao, Che Ping Tang, Wilson Chou, Gao Jile, who studied Reformed theology 
under Cornelius Lentil, they funded the China Graduate School of Theology in the United States in 19, uh, 1969, and later in Hong Kong in 1972. The development of reformed theology in mainland China was also accelerated by Stephen Tong's lay lectures of reformed theology, which started in the 1980s. The scripts and the uh, tapes of Tong's lectures were widely circulated, and the Christians could obtain them for free. At the same time, many books on reformed theology were translated into Chinese, including Hammond Barving's Our Reasonable Faith, Philosophy of Revelation, and the Kuiper's Lectures on Calvinism. Chinese Christians who are interested in Reformed theology are familiar with the terms common grace, general revelation, cultural mandate, and so on. Many imagined Reformed churches were established and a number of traditional house churches received the Reformed faith. Underlying the thriving of Reformed theology in mainland China are two crucial issues which hinder Chinese churches from developing Sino-Reformed theology. First, Chinese churches receive and develop Reformed theology without contextualization. The cause of uncontextualized reformed theology is threefold. Firstly, the desire for westernization, which emerged in the 1880s, continues to have its sway on the Chinese society. The Western is considered as superior to the Chinese. As such, Chinese churches just needed to receive Western reformed theology. Secondly, Chinese churches often misunderstand theological contextualization because of the religious policy in mainland China. At the 19th National Congress of the Communist Party of China in 2017, President Xi Jinping suggested that religion should be synthesized to support and follow Chinese socialism. Then the National Committee of the Three Self Patriotic Movement of the Protestant Church in China announced that Christianity must be synthesized under President Xi's instructions. Note that President Xi was not the first one to raise such a religious policy. The Communist Party of China has consistently carried out this religious policy for many decades. It was President Xi Jinping who explicitly used the word synthesized to define the central feature of his religious policy. Many reformed churches in mainland China are house churches and thus have political tensions with the Chinese government. They resist the government's synthesization of Christianity and consequently condemn the contextualization of Christian faith in China. For them, the true reformed theology can only be built in China by transplanting Western reformed theology. Thirdly, the uncontextualized reformed theology in China is partly, perhaps partly, caused by the theoretical education that Chinese students receive in Western countries. The seminaries, theology colleges, and the theoretical faculties of Western universities, which have a background in reformed theology, seem not to give due attention to the significance of contextual theology during teaching. Few Chinese reformed Christians who completed their theological study in Western countries would art articulate reformed theology contextually in mainland China. Their common practice is traditional reformed confession must be adopted uncritically, and other church ministers must subscribe to these confessions 
region. The second issue in the development of reformed theology in mainland China comes to the fore. That is, reformed theology in mainland China, by a part, has nothing to do with Chinese culture. Many Chinese reformed churches and adherents are reluctant to articulate reformed theology in relation to Chinese culture. The lack of a single reformed confession is evidenced that through such reluctance. As noted earlier, for Bali, an ecclesial confession is created to respond to a specific culture in a specific age. Although its principles can be appropriated by later generations, the confession itself cannot be received without contextualization. Accordingly, the lack of a final reformed confession means that Chinese reformed adherents have not yet developed principles to respond to contemporary Chinese culture. That being so, they seem to live in a cultural vacuum. This indifference to Chinese culture is largely shaped by Chinese reformed churches over emphasis on soteric origin. Some of these churches are even inclined to use the five points laid out in the canon of Dot as the standard to define the term reformed. The overemphasis of soteric origin results in a negative attitude for the Chinese culture. Insofar as what Chinese culture means is transformed completely. Barnum's view of cultural differences provides a helpful apparatus to solve this issue in the development of reform theology in mainland China, pointing Chinese reformed adherents to Sino reformed theology. Barling ties his view of cultural differences to reformed confessions. According to him, the multiplicity of reformed confessions rest not only with progress of history, but also with national differences. Chinese reformed adherents should bear in mind that uh, very much both the historicity of traditional reformed confessions and the Chinese culture as a gift given by God. I suggest that these two factors are critical to the development of Sino-Reformed theology. A theology that works out a Sino-Reformed confession and that engages with Chinese culture. The importance of these two factors can be clearly seen in the uncritical reception of Westminster Confession of Faith in mainland China. In many reformed churches in mainland China, both imagined reformed churches and the traditional house churches, ministers are required to subscribe to a Westminster Confession of Faith. Doubtless, Westminster Confession of Faith is an important reformed legacy and provides many insights in reformed faith. Chinese reformed churches should consult this confession while developing their own reformed theology. Yet, I argue the transplantation of this confession in mainland China is not a reformed practice because it undermines the multiplicity of reformed faith. The point I make here is Westminster Confession of Faith does not fully meet the needs of contemporary Chinese Christians, insofar as it misses several central elements which make up contemporary Chinese culture. Here, I only name two examples. First, it is notable that the Westminster Confession of Faith 
does not mention that God is love. However, the idea of benevolence is fundamental to Chinese culture because of the influence of Confucianism. The theme of benevolence is suggested by modern New Confucianism. Modern New Confucian scholar Wu Zhongshan uses the idea of benevolence to explain the human nature and articulate Confucian ontology. Hence, a report the theology of love can be constructed as a point of contact between reformed theology and the Chinese culture. In this respect, Zwingli's short Christian instruction is more helpful than Western Minster Confession of Faith. While elaborate, uh, elaborating on how humans come to God, Zwingli, uh, Zwingli argues, quote, where the love of God is, there is God. For God is love himself. And whoever is in the love of God is in God, and God is in him. This reformed expression of love contains both ontological and ethical implications, which can be used to facilitate the interaction between Sino reformed theology and the Chinese culture. Second, the state church relationship which is described in the Western Minster Confession of Faith is completely at variance with contemporary Chinese culture and the political situation. The confession states that the duty of local authorities is to protect the church of Christ. Whereas the religious policy in mainland China forces church to agree with Chinese socialism and the atheism. So I think a reformed theology for Chinese people must deal with how Christians should handle the state church relationship in an atheist context. In conclusion, Barwin's view of cultural differences between different nations reminds us that the global development of reformed theology should be diverse rather than uniform. The diversity of reformed theology is evident in the multiplicity of reformed confessions. Of course, Garvinka also highlights the unity of reformed faith and thus starts the balance between the unity and the diversity of reformed theology in different nations. This means that the possibility of sino reformed theology lies in that it pays close heed to the particular, uh, particularity of Chinese culture and then contextualize the legacy of Western reformed theology in mainland China. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Simeon, <coughs> this was an, uh, an interesting illustration also to the, to the lecture of James and the issue of universality and locality. Time for questions. Jungi. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, very interesting uh, presentation uh, as an uh, Asian and Korean living under uh, fusionism culture, I really uh, sympathize of your uh, speech. But uh, as I consider the historical background of reform of the Netherlands, uh, I cannot recommend the Chinese to accept reform theology because, uh, you know, for example, Abraham Kuyper, he uh, referred uh, the fighting for the freedom of conscience of the people in the 16th century. So the reformed people in the Netherlands, they uh, get into the fighting against Spain's uh, Roman Catholic uh, dictatorship. So as I 
as far as I understand, the government control is quite strong in China. But when the people really understand of what is really a contextual reform theology, then I think the people would get into serious dangerous. That is my first impression. And the second one is uh, Avram Kuyper and, and also the other reform theologians stresses very much on the freedom of conscience. Without the conscience, the love cannot be existed and the core of the reform theology could not be uh, practiced, in my view. You mentioned the benevolence of the Confucianism, but the Confucianism is basically about the hierarchical system and uh, making a social harmony. So some of uh, Western theologians who worked in South Korea uh, said, uh, I could not find love in Confucian society because there are much more of the duty or task for the benevolence. So in this sense, I'm really doubt for accepting or adopting reform theology in Asian country. So yeah, I want to listen about your uh, view. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for, uh, for the questions. So uh, your first question is about the uh, political tensions in mainland China. Yeah, uh, of course that's a very uh, that's a very serious question. Yeah, uh, government control is very strong in mainland China, um, but I think uh, the state-church relationship in mainland China is not merely about uh, political issues in China. Uh, in China, Chinese uh, government is is more is more like a religion. So recently, I uh, recently I, I, I'm working on a paper about uh, about the, the 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 characteristic feature of Chinese public public theology, which may have more to do with uh, inter-religious studies, right? So uh, because in my view. Chinese government uh, want to uh, want to make uh, the Communist Party of China uh, a religion in the Chinese society, replacing uh, Confucianism, uh, 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 Christianity, and the Buddhism, and all other religions should be controlled by the government. So this is a, this is more a religion rather than political party. Uh, this is about the first. Uh, uh, Question. So I think this is a very uh, we need to spend more time in exploring how uh, house church, particularly house churches, uh, 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 to deal with the state church relationship in mainland China. And then the second question, second question is about the Confucianism, uh, the uh, the Confucian idea of benevolence. Uh, yes, uh, you are right. Confu uh, a Confucian idea of benevolence is. Uh, it's uh, very complicated, uh, but uh, what I mentioned in my presentation is, fo uh, is, is more philosophically focused. So I mentioned the modern new Confucianism, uh, like Mao Zhongzang. Uh, uh, Mao, Zhong, uh, Mao Zhongzang develops uh, the idea uh, of benevolence and uh, bringing Western, uh, a Western ontological framework uh, into his own system. So, Mo, uh, new Confucian scholar Mo Zhongzang is uh, is a rep, is a, a, repre a representative of modern new Confucian scholars uh, who want to uh, who want to build a bridge between uh, Chinese philosophy and the Western philosophy. I think this uh, this has already gone beyond the traditional. Uh, Confucian system. I think that that is also an example we can learn how how we can bring Western reformed uh, lexi into dialogue with Chinese culture. Yeah. Thank you, Simeon. Thank okay. you. Other questions? Give it a try.
Thank you for. Hello. Thank you for your uh, presentation. I'm also uh, with Yungi. I have uh, a question about Confucian idea of benevolence. In my understanding, God's love and uh, Confucian idea of benevolence are totally different. Um, Confucian idea of benevolence is based on um, works of huma humanity. There is no uh, sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So I can't understand um, how can you uh, relate the God's love and Confucian idea of benevolence. Yes, please yeah, explain more. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, you, you are absolutely right. Uh, there's uh, some fundamental tensions between Confucian idea of benevolence and the Christian idea of, uh, of God. Uh, 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 God, uh, the, the claim God is love, uh, but uh, but I think the fundamental tensions uh, does uh, does not deny the possibility to uh, to construct a dialogue between these two systems. Uh, uh, also, uh, I, I will also refer to Mao Zongshan. Uh, uh, in his system. The Confucian idea of benevolence is a very important ontological foundation uh, for uh, for understanding uh, the meaning of being human. Yeah, but if we uh, if we can, for example, if we can uh, bring uh, the theoretical ideas uh, of the Imago Dei into into the conversation between uh, uh, between. Uh, uh, Mao Zongshan's Confucian systems and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, reformed theology, and uh, uh, we we can say that uh, our humans uh, we humans were created in the Imago Dei. God is love, and our nature should uh, uh, I love should be essential to human nature, and uh, I think this basic idea is shared by the Confucian uh, Confucian system. I think we can have some same dialogues with Confucian uh, systems. Uh, yeah, uh, and yeah, this is my uh, some basic uh, response to this question. Okay, thank you, uh, Simeon. I think we leave it at that. It's it's time for a break now. We have to take into account that we have to follow our schedule. Thank you, uh, Simeon, for presenting. Thank you. Uh, from the other side of the North Sea. And uh, I wish you a pleasant day, and uh, I hope uh, we will once meet in person. Thank you very much. Thank, thank bye you, John. Thank you. As I said, it's, it's time for a break now, uh, but I'd like to ask the presenters of today to join around Shield On that we can make a picture of the presenters. So the presenters of today, before you get your coffee, please come to this corner and uh, we take a picture uh, of, the, of the presenter's team. Okay, thank you. We will uh, start again in 20 minutes.
Uh, dear friends, uh, we have to continue. Uh, the final session of the conference is waiting. And in the final session, we first will listen to the presentation of uh, Gert van Klinken. Gert van Klinken um, is, the, is assistant professor of church history at the Protestant Theological University in Amsterdam and in Groningen. And he has published widely on the relationship between Protestants and Jews in the Netherlands and in Israel in the 19th and 20th century. And the topic of his presentation, the title of his presentation is Herman Bavink and Contemporary Judaism. The floor is yours, Gert. Thank you very much. A conspicuous aspect of prevailing attitudes in the secessionist Christian Reformed Church in the Netherlands with regard to contemporary Judaism in the 19th century is the presence of a chiliastic undertone in Bible exegesis. <coughs> Radical chiliasm, basing itself on an interpretation of the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation, anticipates a future millennium. The Jews will be converted to reign with Christ and the saints from Jerusalem in a uns at an unspecified time in the future. Then Judaism will also suffer from furious attacks as Satan is determined to destroy this reign of peace once and for all. Such radical chiliasm, accompanied by pronounced views on the conversion of the Jewish people, had been rejected by both Calvin and Augustine. However, even the Belgic Confession, Article 37, carries the notion that the last judgment will be preceded by some cataclysmic event at the end of human history, a burning of the old world in fire and flame in order to cleanse it. This allowed for a moderate form of chiliasm to establish itself as a subcurrent in the Reformed theology in the Netherlands. The first time, as far as I'm aware, that Herman Bavink addressed these issues in connection to Judaism was in October 1889 during the Israel Mission Day of the Christian Reformed Church in Utrecht. Secession theologians like Jeff van Andel and M. Sipkes persisted in their view that the return of the Jews to Palestine, even if they had not yet converted to Christianity, could be interpreted as a sign of the impending eschaton. They also interpreted contemporary violence against the Jews, such as the pogroms in Eastern Europe, as part of Satan's plan to stop them from playing their ordained role in the eschatological final acts of human history. As Van Andel remarked, Christ needed the continuing existence of the Jewish people if the unfolding of a preordained biblical scenario was to succeed. If Satan was about to oppose the prospect of prophecy being fulfilled, as might be anticipated, it was obvious that he, Satan, would also try to prevent the Jews from playing their assigned role. In Utrecht, members of the Christian Reformed Church discussed the great works of the Lord that will be seen among Israel. And they did so together with representatives of the London Society for Promoting Christianity amongst the Jews and also of the Dutch Society for Israel. F.A.A. Korf and A. van Os, both members of the Dutch Reformed Church. Typical was their conviction that Christians had to confine themselves to a supportive role of prayer. This framework of thinking was strongly deterministic. God alone could open the Jewish hearts, and God would do so during the final acts of human history. 
The following propositions were put forward by Van Andel. First, the fact that the Jewish people are being preserved till this day, despite so many dangers, can only be explained from the fact that the historical task of these Jewish people, far from being fulfilled some 1800 years ago, has yet to be borne out in the future. Second, in accordance with the book of Revelation, we expect that a remnant of the Jewish people will be preserved by elective grace. Third, this remnant will finally be converted. It is destined to contribute substantially, both in suffering and in testimony, to the flowering of the kingdom of God in the final stages of human history. False, the land of Canaan and the city of Jerusalem will set the stage for the final battle between the converted people of Israel and the anti-Christian world. Such views now in 1889 were strongly opposed by Hermann Bavink. He disagreed with Van Andel and the others. Bavink's lecture, Contemporary Judaism, lacks any notion of a distinct destination of the Jewish people in the future. Jewish identity for Bavink was um, stamped not by a bright future, but rather by a guilty past. The divining moment in Jewish history for Bavink was the transformation of Jewish thinking after the return from the Babylonic captivity. It was then, I quote Bavink, that the Israelite lowered himself to become the Jew. The place of former priests and prophets was taken by the teachers of the law. Prayer receded behind standard formulas. The spirit had to make way for the latter. Jewish national separatism, Bavik affirmed, carried difficulties for living together of Jews with other nations even in the modern age. Once again, I quote Bavink, since Israel has blinded itself for God's intention to reconcile Jew and heathen into a new mankind through Jesus Christ, Judaism has been enclosing itself behind an impenetrable wall. The effect is that it conflicts in every way with the Jephthite and Christian character of other nations. End of quote. To bridge the gap between Sam and Javed, Bavink dreamt of some Hegelian synthesis. Salvation, both for the Jew and the heathen, could only be found in Christ. This, however, was not meant to say that Jewish identity had become fully irrelevant. The wall of separation, Ephesians 2 verse 14, would be torn down, but not by turning the Jew into heathen or heathen into Jew. This concept of ongoing Jewish identity, even within the Christian community and church, was typical for Isaac da Costa and for the Dutch Society for Israel, the DSI, where much, if not most, of the members came for the, from the Dutch Reformed Church and where the ideas of the late Isaac da Costa remained a motivating force. And yet, even this position, Bavink was to change for himself in 1901. The Reformed Church is in the, in the Netherlands, of, a, of which Bavink, of course, became a member, were founded in 1892. Four years later, the General Synod launched an ambitious blueprint of Jewish mission, affirming a strict substitution theology. As the church has become the new Israel, Jewish refusal to join the church implied a willing defiance of God's will. An ambitious program of Jewish mission progressively developed during the early decades of the 20th century until the appointment, appointment of full-time missionaries and distribution of the Herald of the Messiah on a national scale. After 1917, 
every local consistory of the Reformed churches in the Netherlands became responsible for distributing the Herald of the Messiah to all known Jewish addresses within its territory, three times a year. The dual aim was not only to bring about Jewish conversion as far as possible, but also to combat rabbinism as an inimical force that was opposed to Christianity. Unconverted Judaism was clearly perceived as a potentially dangerous Semitic force in the context of a Jephthite society. For Bavink, unlike Abraham Kuyper, Jews and Judaism never became a major focus of interest. Again, unlike Kuyper, Bavink also remained quite restrained in his assessment of the supposed negative effects of Jewish presence in Dutch society as a whole. As noted, da Bavink seemed to sympathize with the Dutch society for Israel, notwithstanding its notion that the Jewish community was entitled to the name of Israel. It is therefore surprising to find that the Jewish mission of the Reformed churches in the Netherlands between 1896 and as late as 1965 would continuously and emphatically refer to Herman Bavink as one of the prime architects of their chosen missionary cause. That was so different from the secessionist background and also so different from the Dutch Society for Israel. One of the main principles of the young reformed churches in the Netherlands laid down by the Middelburg Synod of 1896 was the vindication of substitution theology. The Jewish people was emphatically no longer Israel. So why was it, we may wonder, that Bavink's authority was constantly referred to to defend the position of this Jewish mission. A clue lies in the Reformed Dogmatics, where Bavink discusses the famous text in the letter of the Apostle Paul to the Romans, 11, 25, 26. Lest you be wise in your own conceits, I want you to understand the mystery, brethren, a hardening has come upon part of Israel until the full number of Gentiles come in, and so all Israel will be saved. So far, the Apostle Paul. It had been commonplace in Reformed Protestantism to assume that this Bible text referred to a to be expected conversion of the Jewish people in an unspecified future. This would be brought about by God, who alone was in the position of taking away the hardening upon Israel. This had been the exegesis not only of Da Costa and the Dutch Society for Israel, but also of many in the Christian Reformed Church. It was also compatible to Gileasm. Bavink in 1901 was breaking new ground in full accordance with the decisions of the Middelburg Synod of five years before. All Israel, past Israel, he wrote, was not to be understood as a sum of the entire Jewish people, but only referring to those Jews that would convert to Christianity. The incoming of the full number of the Gentiles and the salvation of Israel were parallel aspects of one and the same process. The ingathering of the elect, whatever their national background. Bavink added the explicit remark that an anticipation of a Jewish return to Palestine obviously did not belong to Paul's thinking, nor did the prospect of a rebuilding of the temple or a millennial interlude between the present world and the second coming. So, in Romans 11, verse 26, should not be taken in any temporary sense, but as thus. In this way, 
it says the elect from the Jews would find their way to salvation together with the elect from the nations. The effect on Reformed theology cannot be overestimated. As demonstrated by the Reformed media, most members of the Reformed churches in the Netherlands were quite aware of the fact that their new Jewish mission provided a new beginning, not to say a break with the past. From now on, there would be no more room for Gideasm, even in its milder forms. Also, the tone of addressing Dutch Jewry hardened. A Jewish refusal to accept the message that was being brought to them by the herald of the Messiah showed in reformed eyes that the Jews willingly and knowingly disobeyed the will of God as brought to them by the Jewish mission. And it was very explicitly stated, retribution would not fail to be forthcoming, either in this life or in the afterworld. During the antebellum, Bavings exegesis of Romans 11, 25-26, so became a building block of a Jewish mission that later generations were to repudiate as aggressive and conceited. But that came later. In 1921, the Herald of the Messiah mourned Bavink as one of its main sources of inspiration, as the man who had shown their mission how to move forward. Kaan Schilder, also strongly opposed to the remaining legacy of Gileasm, was of the same opinion, 1923. Schilder advised his audience to read and reread Bavink's reflections on Israel as a necessary antidote to what Schilder called the present re-emergence of Gileasm in the guise of American evangelicalism. During his lifetime, Bavink must have noted that his authority was being used to bolster a missionary approach that differed widely from his own secessionist backgrounds. One of his pupils, J. Dauma, was appointed as one of the synodal deputies for Jewish mission. However, judging by the context tense of their archives, Bavink never communicated any misgivings about the Jewish mission and of his own authority being used to defend this Jewish mission within the circles of the RCN or in correspondence with the deputies for Jewish mission. He never did so. On the other hand, outside the Reformed churches in the Netherlands, during a meeting of the Dutch Society for Israel, in a setting connected to the Dutch Reformed Church in 1911, then suddenly he showed his ambivalence towards the project of the Jewish mission by saying that he was still in favor of the idea that the Jews somehow were still the old people of Israel and that he still felt sympathy for what the Dutch Society for Israel was trying to do. But as he never opposed the way his authority was being used uh, within the Reformed churches in the Netherlands, his spiritual legacy would remain a point of reference for those who were trying to convert the Jews uh, by missionizing among them and using the heralds of the Messiah and also by opposing Zionism. It may explain that Bavink's legacy never became influential or even remotely popular in the theology of church and Israel that was trying to find a 
alternative paradigm for Jewish mission from the 1950s. My final remark is that though Bafink admittedly never was very much interested in Judaism, we might, may have here an instance of a field in Dutch church history in which we may have two Bavings. There was one Bavink who was constantly being referred to in the Dutch Jewish mission as practiced by the Reformed churches in the Netherlands. Bavink never opposed to that, at least not within the Reformed churches in the Netherlands. And on the other hand, we have a Bavink who did say that he had some reservations, but he did not make them public within the, his own church, but he discussed these reservations in the context of the Dutch Society of Israel. I thank you for your attention. We thought we had got rid of the two Bavings, uh, Gert, and uh, there they pop up again. Thank you, uh, Gert, for your uh, lecture uh, on this interesting topic. Anyone who has a question? working? Yes, you're very okay. clear. Good. For the, for the nice presentation, uh, the, the main line in the reform dogmatics, as you said, was interpreting whole Israel as including all the, the, the whole church, including Jews and, and, and Gentiles, or that in such a way Israel will be saved. But sometimes Bavik also seems to hint at least at the possibility of a conversion of the Jews in the latter days. For instance, in his um, congratulations for the for the for the society, it's, it's it's just one page, and also I think in the in the archives there are some manuscripts in which he discusses that that it is an option at least that um, that the Jewish people will be converted in the latter days. So, is there an ambivalence in Bavik himself there? I would um, uh, suppose so, and this ambivalence is an aspect of reformed uh, theology that has been uh, rather overlooked in historiography. For if we look up what leading reformed theologians, so belonging to the reformed churches in the Netherlands, have to say about Judaism, we find that uh, between um, 1890 and 1940, discussions about Judaism are always and always referring to Chiliasm. So Chiliasm is not a phenomenon in their perspective. It's a, fri it's a fringe of what re Reformed theology is. It is something of a, um, a permanent um, a danger and also a permanent presence within um, their um, church community. And Bavink, in my view, is at this critical point indeed a double Bavink. We have the Bavink who is siding with his um, secessionist ancestry and also siding with Da Costa. And we have a Bavink uh, that who is a paragon of the Jewish mission. And this is also an important aspect of reformed church history for a, um, a very different reason. Uh, for you will understand that we have a special interest for those members of the reformed churches who took a Jewish uh, members of society um, uh, into hiding during the Nazi rule, during the Holocaust. Many uh, members of the Reformed Church, relatively many, uh, were active in hiding Jews 
for the persecution of Hitler and the Holocaust. Why would they do that? In the last few years, many Jewish and secular scholars have of course said, well, we can only think of one reason for reformed families to do that, and that of course is to convert these Jews. So that makes it more important to have a look what these families have to say for themselves, and then preferably by looking what they have written about it in writing in the 40s, so that you have contemporary evidence, why are these people hiding the Jews? And then the evidence is quite convincing. Then we see in 60, 70 percent of the material that we have, that chiliasm, traditional 19th century chiliasm in the sense of Van Andel is a motivating force in what these people are doing under uh, the rule of Adolf Hitler. So this is an important point. Thank you, uh, Gert, for your paper. One other early interaction that Bavink has in his young life with Judaism is in his letters with Snooker Chonye uh, in the Lights of Cleanscap, and it's a very awkward exchange. Uh, Snooker Chonye at this point is in Strasbourg in Germany, and um, he publishes a, a piece that's um, very critical of some anti-Jewish writings. Snooker Konya publishes this piece that critiques some anti-Jewish German writings. And then Bavink wrote to him, um, I think assuming that Snook was defending Judaism as a religion over against Christianity, and Bavink writes asking, why are you defending this other religion? And um, Snook writes back to Bavink saying, you have no idea what this is like in Germany and the level of um, persecution of Jewish people here, and you don't know how to distinguish between experience of being Jewish and thinking about religions in abstract terms, and you have to think about lived religion. And he tells Bavink, you have to think about theology in relation to um, social uh, economics and um, politics, and don't talk about it in abstraction. Uh, and if you saw what I had seen in Germany, you wouldn't be criticizing me right now. And it, so Snook really rebukes Bavink, the young Bavink, for the way that he talks about Judaism in very abstract terms. Um, and then after that, you, as you say, you know, he, he's this very um, reluctant figure to talk about it publicly, as he demonstrated very well. Um, I do wonder if that early exchange with Snook Rochonia has some kind of long-term impact because it's so direct and forceful, telling him you, you, this isn't an abstraction, these are real people's lives and you haven't seen what's happening over the border in Germany. I, I don't know if that helps clarify maybe some sense of this double babbing on the, the Jewish question. Yes, thank you very much for your uh, valuable comments. We can see that uh, Bafink was a, a man with an amazing scope of knowledge, uh, who was also acutely aware of developments in the liberal and in even the socialist um, uh, wings of Dutch uh, society. So he would be aware of a diversity, the diversity of opinions also outside the sphere of the church. And what we see is that he knows it all, but he is also a very, very loyal son of the church. He wants to be loyal to the church. And then I would like to uh, discuss that uh, with uh, those who defend, who defend the one Bafink hypothesis. Uh, we see uh, in the early 20th century in this particular field uh, that he is constantly defending given church policy. And when it comes to the idea that there is no future of Israel outside the church, and that uh, Israel, as it exists as a non-Christian entity in Dutch society, is a dangerous force for Christianity, 
a force uh, that has to be combated by spiritual means, then it is simply church policy. This is the church policy um, laid down uh, in Middelburg and in Arnhem uh, 1902. And then we find that Bavink somehow will never contradict a policy that is church policy, and that if he does so, he will do so in what is a private atmosphere, not as a uh, theologian of the RCN or the Free University, not within the framework of the Reformed Churches in the Netherlands, but in private conversation with those who are not members of the Reformed Churches in the Netherlands. Okay, Gert, uh, thank you for your presentation and uh, for the Q&A. Thank you. Then we come to the final lecture uh, of our conference, and uh, that lecture will be given by Kees van der Kooi. And Kees van der Kooi um, is a professor emeritus of systematic theology at Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam, and a distinguished, distinguished lecturer at Erasmus University in Rotterdam. And the topic he's going to address is, is um, Herman Bavink and the future of reform theology, some critical notes. The floor is yours, Case. Thank you very much. Herman Bavink's reform dogmatics is rightly regarded a classic in the Reformed theology, in the Reformed tradition. It is classic in the sense that it is a point of reference for many theologians who want to be part of the Reformed tradition. It is recognized as a text where we recognize nothing less, I quote from David Tracy, nothing less than the disclosure of what we name truth, end quote. He listens to the scripture, and, or at least he wants to listen to the scripture, and engages in conversation with one's own cultural context, his own cultural context. The way Babing enters into that conversation, listens to the scriptures, draws from the church of ages, and chooses his own position, although sometimes hesitant and not always clear, is appealing to many. That is also clear in conferences like this one. In hindsight, it becomes also clear in what way Babing was a child of his own times and took from his own cultural context. His doctrine of scripture is an example of this. Babing has emphatically distanced himself from the mechanical theory of inspiration by grasping at the concept of organic. What exactly that means, organic, for example, for the distinction between historical truth and what is said in accord with older worldview, secundum apparitiam, ultimately remained vague. However, it is clear that Babing wanted to listen to scripture. He refers to a multitude of texts in the various subjects in his Reformed dogmatics. In this, we recognize the Reformed theologian. Babing dogmatics is classic in the way uh, the sovereignty of God functions as a pivotal theme. The doctrine of God even begins with a paragraph about the incomprehensibility of God, God's being is infinitely exalted above creation. We humans live in complete dependence of God. Bowing's theology and spirituality 
go hand in hand and that he wants to bow to the depth of God's substance and his counsel. It is therefore typical that in the chapter on the counsel of God, one finds nothing less than a tirade against modern and old forms of Pelagianism. I quote, Pelagianism scatters flowers over graves, turns death into an angel, regards sin as mere weakness, lectures on the uses of adversity, and considers this the best of the possible world. Calvinism has no use for such drivel. It tolerates no such delusion, takes full account of the seriousness of life, champions the right of the Lord, the Lord of Lords, and humbly bows in admiration before the inex inexplicable sovereign will of God Almighty. End quote. This God, who is the Father of Jesus Christ, must be honored can be trusted as the father of Jesus Christ. However, the way in which Babing gave a foundation for the confession of God's sovereignty and, and exaltation shows a strategy that, in my opinion, should not be followed by us. God's uh, in his treatment of the transcendent or incommunicable attributes of God, God's aseitas, aseitas, his independence and immutability, he points, he uses again and again two sources to support his position, Bible and philosophy in tandem. God's perfection, he writes, implies immutability. I quote, Not only does scripture testify that in God there is no variation or shadow due to change, but reflection on this matter, reflection, thought on this matter, also leads to the same conclusion. Becoming presupposes a cause, for there is no becoming without a cause. Absolute being is because it is. The idea of God itself implies immutability. Neither increase nor dim diminution is conceivable with respect to God. He cannot change for better or worse, for he is the absolute, the complete, the true being. Becoming is an attribute of creatures, a form of change in space and time. End quote. My conclusion when I read this is, this is nothing less than the continuation of a long-standing marriage between theology, Christian theology, and substance metaphysics. And should we continue that? as contemporary listeners to the Bible. Also in the way he speaks of the counsel of God, the influence or the great impact, the important impact of classical substance metaphysics is recognizable. The following quote is an example of the enormous impact of 19th century idealism and logos speculation. He writes, God's counsel is one and simple, one idea. The counsel of God must be considered a single and simple decree. At the Westminster Assembly, the delegates discussed whether to speak of the decree in the singular or in the plural. The Westminster Confession only uses the word in the singular. And indeed, the world plan, welt idee, is one simple conception in the mind of God, just as Minerva, Minerva, emerges full grown from the head of Jupiter, and just as genius all at once completely grabs 
the idea of a work of, our, of art. So the world plan is eternally complete in the divine consciousness. But just as an artist can only execute his vision in stages, so God unveils before the eyes of his creatures the one vision of his counsel in a series of phases. I ask my question. Where in this quote did the drama go that we come across in many parts of the scripture when we read the narrative of the Bible? In the narrative of the Bible, in salvation history, we again and again hear or read that God's dealings with men are a struggle. It seems that it is not always clear to the Almighty God Himself, if we listen to the Scriptures, how to proceed. I take as an example Exodus chapter 32 to illustrate this. After the people of Israel have danced around the golden calf, God considers the experiment with his people, with this people, to have failed and wants to pull the plug on the enterprise. Like an entrepreneur who faces near bankruptcy, he wants to make a new start with Moses, who then enters into negotiations with, the, with Adonai, with the Almighty One, how to proceed. Do we have to consider these negotiations between Moses and God? And God who, who retreats and, and doesn't want to go on. Have we to consider these parts of the Bible as mere anthropomorphisms and not take seriously? Or shall we stick to the text as students of the Reformation? The Reformed Church started in reading the scriptures again. Luther criticized the Aristotelian philosophy. Should we be philosophers as students of Bavink? Or should we be students of the scriptures? Did God already know what he was going to do? Or shall we stick to the text? I quote an Old Testament scholar, our colleague at the Freie Universiteit, Joop Dubbing, writing on Exodus 32, verse 10. Quote, the exegete reads that Moses does remind God of his covenantal obligations and does confront him with the disastrous consequences his actions would have for himself, for Yahweh, for, because Moses is clever enough to know that a direct appeal for mercy on behalf of this unfaithful people would not be wise at this moment, end quote. This whole passage goes against the strain of a theology that declares God to be omniscient. A second example from the scriptures where we find the word may be in Jeremiah 26, verse 2 and 3, and Jeremiah 36, verse 3 and 7, there the word maybe is used by God himself. God speaking himself says, it may be that they will listen. I want to argue that the Reformed theology in the slipstream also of Bavink and Calvin, should take such texts seriously and not deactivate them like a bomb in advance. This means that the narrative of the Old Testament and of the New Testament should be taken as a critical starting point 
for our the systematic theological reflection. If we do so, it is not done to interpret the passages I mentioned that speak of God's regret or repentance or his anger or wrath or hurt as anthropomorphisms and thereby enfeeble it as to the doctrine of God. Another example, take Genesis 18 that tells how God descended to inspect the moral state of affairs in Sodom and Gomorrah and then allowed himself to be involved by Abraham in highly uncomfortable negotiations about the minimum number of righteous people needed to preserve the city. From the perspective of our doctrine of God's omniscience, those negotiations are in fact futile. God already knew the outcome for a long time. So we can continue up to the parable of the tenants in the vineyard in the New Testament. In this parable, Jesus tells his own story as a story of constantly, constantly new initiatives by the owner trying to get his rightful share of the result of his investment. Should we take that seriously? Or shall we say, it was already set in God's eternity as part of that one and whole council. The dominance of um, that a kind of metaphysics in, the re in, in, in relation to the doctrine of God, so the dominance of the incommunicable qualities over the communicable, or the dominance of the properties of his transcendence over those of his descendants is also found, we can also find that in uh, Christology. And then I point to uh, an issue that I have uh, discussed more extensively in my Warfield lectures of 2014. You can read about it and I refer now briefly to, to it. Historically, Logos Christology has overshadowed the text that described the identity of Jesus with the word spirit. Yet, the spirit as identity marker of Jesus is supported by a very strong textual tradition, both in the Synoptic Gospels and also in Acts 10. The presence of God with Jesus, his identity, is connected there with anointing or baptism with the Spirit. I will give now only my short conclusion. Word and Spirit, Sonship and being baptized by the Spirit are two lines in the Synoptic Gospels and also in Paul, in John, two lines which both show up without necessarily being reduced to each other. The challenge for contemporary reformed systematic theology is how the language of sonship is related to the language of the spirit and how these words, these metaphors, have to be interpreted, have to be interpreted ontologically. Do they contain ontological status? Is sonship a result of being anointed with the Spirit or being bearer of the Spirit? Or the other way around is the fact that he is bearer of the Spirit already implied in, was implied in his sonship? The biblical material, the courage to follow the evidence in the text and the teaching of the church should be conducive here for our discourse and thoughts. I will not say that the, that the outcome is already set, but we shall, we, I think we, 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 we are obliged as reformed students to follow the text. And of course, the teaching of the church of ages, they also tell something, but we have to be critical here. 
In the light of the foregoing reflections, I draw the conclusion that attention to the spirit in the life of Jesus will drastically in reinterpret and correct classical Logos Christology. We are dealing with two models. One is an ascending model, synoptic gospels mainly, and the other a descending model, John and Paul. The descending model of return or return model on first sight integrates the ascending model, but at the same time the ascending model maintains its own strength. Apart from each other, both models lead to one-sidedness. The best way to keep them together for contemporary theology and for the sake of pastorate is to see them as complementary and reciprocal. The ascending Christology that speaks of Christ as anointed with the eschatological spirit receives a further and decisive interpretation from the side of a descending Christology or return model because the letter articulates a unique anchoring of his sonship in God, the being of God. Also, the descending or return model gets a radical specification from the ascending model because the ascending model makes undoubtedly clear that this person, the actual Jesus of Nazareth, was a Jew who lived in his times by the power of the Holy Spirit. Spirit Christology that incorporates both an ascending and descending model enlightens and clarifies the inner dynamics by which the sonship of Jesus was realized. This means that we cannot speak of the Logos, as Barving did, and pre-existence apart from the story of Jesus Christ. The binding to this actual person and history implies that the concept of Logos cannot be understood in abstraction from the drama of salvation, history of God, of the God of Israel. Logos cannot be defined a priori a priori, by properties which are deduced from our human restrictions and boundaries, like omniscience and omnipresence. Here we have to distance us as reformed students from Barwink. The drama of the covenant between God and Israel, in which non-Jews are added by grace, should be taken seriously as a vantage point from which we confess who God is. So will we be students of Greek philosophy, followers of that? We will study it, but will we follow it? Or do we follow the biblical narrative with all the contingent elements in it? Of course, this touches upon the theme of the cosmic Christ and his pre-existence. What can we say about the pre-existence of Jesus Christ, of the Son? I would say not so much. I want to say only a few words about that, but these words need to be said. When in the Pauline letters and in the Gospel of John, Christ is confessed as already active in creation from all eternity, this is the language of overwhelming surprise and praise of the richness of God. The concept of pre-existence points to the fact that the coming of Christ in our world has its anchor, its origin in the life of the tri of God, the triune God. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven he became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and Virgin Mary and was made human. Yes, that is liturgical language. Confession, balancing on the tight rope of what must be said, touching upon what can be said. Systematic theology should help the reader of the Bible, the preacher, the pastor, and every child of God to affirm that surprise of our salvation, that he came to us, that he came down. 
We stand on the floor of history and are participants in that history as well as recipients of that history and do not have a place in the director's room. Constructive theological reflection should make space for two movements. One that walks along with the drama of the covenant and one that looks back on the drama in light of the outcome. And that movement, hence and for, ne, uh, hence and, for, and back, that should be a movement in systematic theology itself. And that changes, of course, the task of systematic theology. Okay, in summary, the future of Reformed theology is served when the Bible is taken seriously in a new way. And we have there to learn from contemporary biblical scholarship. The diversity and the contingency on the level of the narrative, of the biblical narrative and text should not be absorbed and immunized by a doctrine of God that was determined by an older Greek, Aristotelian, Platonic, metaphysical tradition. Thank you very much. Thank you um, very much, Case, for your provoking talk. Time for questions. No questions uttered by the <laughs> I don't think so, but um, I, I, I will wait a few seconds. Yeah, you are the first. <coughs> I'm David Meinberg, uh, PhD student at University of Edinburgh. Thank you for your wonderful lecture. Um, so you brought up many uh, different tensions that you kind of saw uh, in the Bible, talking about um, how we can understand moments of God seeming to regret and turn. And um, we kind of began the conference yesterday talking about tensions in Bavink's thought and how he tried to come to synthesis. And as I understand, what Bavink was trying to do when he uh, wrote a book called Reform Dogmatics is explicitly trying to do theology in a reformed tradition, uh, not just him as an isolated theologian, but operating within this stream and trying to move theology forward. In his prolegomena, as you know, he uh, outlines how theology seems to develop over time and he is trying to pick up the synthesis that uh, previous theologians had already picked up. And many of the uh, tensions that you brought up, particularly with regard to how we can understand God seeming to regret and yet uh, him also claiming to be uh, omniscient and sovereign over all things that occur, Bavink picked up those uh, Syntheses and carried them forward. He accepted them. So if we were to take up the proposals that you're suggesting, in what sense would this new theology still be reformed? What, what dis, uh, is distinctively reformed about these new uh, revisions that you're suggesting? Thank you. What I, in any way, would, and what I also, in my presentation now um, said is the strong uh, emphasis on God's sovereignty. That is something that, that, uh, that uh, we are dependent from God's action. God, the living God. Yeah? Uh, we are dependent of God's continued action by the Holy Spirit, yeah? 
And if I read the text, the narrative of the New Testament, then he is always again and again searching for a way forward, also with our generation, with our difficulties in our culture. He's searching for our res response. Um, and every time when I, I am leading a church, of, a church service, I start with the words, um, who will not lose the work of his hands. Yeah? Of the, 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 die niet zal vaar, laten varen het werk van zijn handen in Dutch. That is very important. That says something about that we trust God for and that we trust that he is still uh, pooling us. Um, it will mean what the implication of what I said is that uh, the, uh, the doctrine of the God's omniscience, I will not say that that, that I will reject it, but at least it comes somewhere in an upper shelf. And I would like to uh, propose that we now first start with those tensions that we see on the level of the text and not um, uh, downplay that. Uh, and to be honest, I see that our, that in Calvin, in our tradition, and also in Barving, these texts have been downplayed. And in name of a doctrine of God uh, that is in many respects wonderful, but uh, also imbued by this metaphysical tradition, uh, where I think, no, that then then we have to read the Bible again. So in that way, I feel very reformed that I want to listen to the Bible again. The same way Luther and the reformers did in their time over against the Roman Catholic Church, who said, come, 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 this is tradition. And okay, it's fine, Aristotle, he is one of us. Plato, he's one of us. Finally, yeah. No, if they go against what I read in the Bible, what do I have to take seriously? And does that bring does that bring the systematic theologian into a problem? Yes, 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 yes. But it may be that the task of systematic theology is not to make one whole coherent system. That is the 19th century ideal. No, as in Calvin, Calvin's Institutes, Heiko Oberman called it a cookbook, yeah? Not more and not less. How to make your meal, how to do pastorate, how to preach about this text. Systematic theology should help you that. Should help you to know what you definitely have to say, what you can say, what you definitely should not say, and what you maybe in some circumstances can say. That kind of differentiations that we have to learn. That's, that, that's my answer. Anyone else? Henk. Thank you, Case, for your passionate biblical theology. If we would go into a discussion about perfect being theology related to the scriptures and so on, that, that would take the rest of the day. I have a question about Bavink, because you correctly in your Christian dogmatics said that philosophy is part of the game of systematic theology, but then also contemporary philosophy. So if I understand Bavin correctly, he on the one hand wanted to deal with the reformed tradition 
as it was formed by Aristotelian philosophy, at least in the orthodoxy phase, maybe more than in Calvin, but he also certainly in the end of his life wanted to deal with contemporary philosophy. So without copying Bavinck, leave alone the reformed scholastics, which direction would you, would you prefer in the present contemporary philosophical debates as a discussion partner for reformed theology? And then you have the complication also that in the New Testament, there's maybe more philosophical influence than the suggestion oh, yeah, sure. that that's only an opposition between Plato no, no, and Aristotle no, no. and the Bible. But that's a, that's a different discussion. But, but, but for the 21st century, yeah. what would you advise us? Yeah, no, um, you're right that, that, uh, that, that Bavink, of course, uh, distances himself from uh, parts of that metaphysical uh, tradition. One of the uh, presentations today, uh, also from Bruce Past, he, uh, he appointed to the, the, that. Um, and uh, uh, I would say uh, Babing shows himself sometimes to be eclectic uh, in his uh, reformed dogmatics. There are strong Hegelian elements in it uh, as well. Um, in that way, uh, modern and now, okay. Um, he is more modern than, uh, than many people today think. Yeah? Um, but okay, for today, um, we have also, of course, we and I also use unconsciously uh, contemporary uh, philosophical ele elements. That is, that is, that is true. Um, uh, but one, one element what I uh, would like to uh, prefer is um, at least in, uh, by, by using uh, uh, modern physics is that we uh, we we think uh, less in terms of subject object and more in terms of multimodal multi-layered reality yeah and that helps me also to think about the presence of God the presence of the Spirit of God is much more um, uh, in our reality already working. So um, when Kelvin speaks about the Spirit as the, uh, as the hidden uh, working operatio um, uh, of, this, of the Spirit, then I can sometimes, or then I can uh, combine that with with uh, but with, with elements of modern uh, physics. And also if it is about um, the hope or our faith in God's activity and his um, uh, ability to make something new, then of course we have uh, uh, the contemporary uh, uh, discovery of, uh, of emergency of emergent facts, yeah, e uh, novel, novel things that are emergent from a and an, uh, e emergent new things are not um, predescribable. They are not voorspelbaar. They are not predictable. Yeah, uh, and I think okay, that could uh, be in line with. Uh, the Holy Spirit as the agent of novelty and renewal and our hope, yeah? Now, okay, so uh, of course I use also contemporary philosophy, but my, um, the, 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 the challenge for us is be critical on that and always start on the level of what you read and serious exegetical work, uh, and that changes also our 
doctrinal overview. Anyone else? Final question, maybe? If not, case, thank you very much. Okay, we are coming to a close now of the conference, and uh, I'd like to thank all the presenters in these two, day, these two days for what they have presented to us, the work they have done before, and the results that we heard in these two days. And I think uh, we can be really grateful to them that they uh, wanted to share their insights, their findings, and their ideas uh, with us. And I want to thank you who was uh, in this conference as an attendant. Uh, wonderful that you were here, maybe here in this room and maybe uh, via YouTube, online, um, and the same counts, of course, for the online presenters uh, who also, of course, in, in a way had a difficult time by not being in our atmosphere, but still we are very grateful for what they brought to us. So thank you all for, for, for being here and for sharing in this Bavink Centennial Congress. And uh, I'd like uh, to thank four people uh, in special. And um, <clears throat> in the first place, that's the people that have helped organizing this place and having the conference here, having the internet connections, especially uh, Joop van Dijk, who is the verger of this church, uh, Hugo den Boer of the Theological University, and Hans van Gelder. Behind the screens, they have made it possible and it uh, was of a great help because everything went very smooth um, and I'm very grateful for what they did. And the same goes for Gert van Klinke, who this afternoon led us through Kampen and showed us some glimpses of uh, the life of Bavink and the, the, the places, the locations of Bavink. So I would thank them with an applause. Okay, thank you very much, and um, I wish you safe travels wherever you have to go, to fly maybe, maybe you, you are staying one night over, and all the people take the train or the car. Uh, I wish you all safe travels, uh, and I hope uh, to see you, of course, soon in, this, in a context around Bavink or Neo-Calvinism or in any other context. Thank you very much, and uh, hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.